All right, Candice, we're about two minutes in. I want to kick it off. Um, why don't you read our, um, our usual introduction? I'll turn it over to you, please. Sounds <clears> good. <throat> Hello, and welcome to the Wall Street Blockchain Alliance's 2021 Crypto Investor Summit. Before we begin, a bit of housekeeping for today's session. This webinar is being recorded. All attendees will be in listen-only mode. Attendees are encouraged to submit questions for each panel using the Zoom chat function. We will reserve time at the ends of each session for audience Q&A. Please keep in mind that this event is offered for general information and educational purposes only and is not intended to constitute investment, legal, tax, or accounting advice. Any views or opinions expressed during this event are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the view of the Wall Street Blockchain Alliance or our participants' firms. And now we will turn the event over to our chair of the Wall Street Blockchain Alliance, Mr. Ron Quaranta. Candice, thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. It's great to have all of our panelists here as well. For those of you who've seen the agenda, uh, we have a kickoff fireside kind of innovation conversation that I want to kick off right away. Uh, and I'm very privileged to have uh, Sharon Leibowitz of S&P Global and Nick Ogertsov of Luca, both of which we're very privileged to have uh, as WSBA members. Sharon, Nick, I wanted to start this brief conversation giving you both an opportunity. Tell us a little bit about your background. The three of us have come from a broad financial markets background. Wanted to hear how you landed in the crypto space. Sharon, why don't we start with you? Sure, thanks, Ron, and, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Sharon Liebowitz, Senior Director of Innovation at S&P uh, Dow Jones Indices, and I really focus on emerging tech, including digital assets, um, AI, and alternative data. Uh, the development and launch of the crypto indices have been a key focus of mine over the last couple of years. Uh, in terms of where I come from, I kind of grew up in the financial services industry, really did a lot of uh, technology project management. I worked for most of the big banks at Deutsche Bank, UBS, JP Morgan. Um, but in 2015, actually, I went on on my own starting a robo-advisor. And um, while I was building that, I was doing a lot of networking, as everybody who's uh, in the startup world knows. And uh, it seemed that the, the, the coolest kids that I talked to were all, in, uh, were all doing crypto stuff. So I sort of started to get interested in that um, at that same time. Great. Thanks, Sharon. And Nick, uh, please say hello to everyone. We'd we'll, we'll love to hear how you landed in our, in our crypto world as well. Yeah, thank you very much, and pleasure to to, uh, to 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 speak to everyone. So, yeah, I also come from a very traditional um, Wall Street financial background. I spent the first half of my career at very large banks, uh, UBS notably, and, and and others, and and then later I was uh, chief operating officer and chief risk officer of a publicly traded firm called KCG, uh, a Wall Street trading firm where we're trading um, ten to fifteen percent of U.S. volume, U.S. daily volume in equities. So very traditional sort of financial background. I've also sat on the board of DTCC and and, and such, but um, but then but then um, after the sort of the more traditional uh, traditional path, um, uh, I'm I'm now a chairman of Luca, the software and data company, where we focus on um, developing products for specifically for the digital asset space and crypto crypto market space. And including data products um, such as um, such, such as the one that uh, that we've collaborated with uh, with S and P, and we're you know very very privileged and proud to be able to support them in their efforts in that in that area. But we also have um, software products and, and and other things that we do for the crypto industry as well. Um, and yeah, how I end up with in crypto is it 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 seems like an incredible uh, amount of innovation is happening in the space. And yet, coming from a very traditional Wall Street background, in some ways you can sort of see the future a little bit because a lot of the the, the building blocks that, that are still being built in in the crypto space have already happened in in in, in traditional finance. So um, it, it's actually an amazing place to be to be able to build this new industry and, and help you know help um, help 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 it evolve, and yet have a little bit of a you know a little bit of a crystal ball to see what you know what what's coming in many ways. So. Uh, it's been, been an amazing experience. Nick, Sharon, it's, it's, a, it's a privilege to have you both. I wanted to kick off a little bit, and you both referenced the, the work that uh, both Luca and S&P did on the indices. And I, I, I know the three of us have been using the word, and I think we globally use the word infrastructure way too much in, in way too many different capacities now. But I think one of the, the conversations we've been having, particularly from the institutional engagement perspective of, of crypto, is, is, is indices. And that was that big first step 
Sharon, can you start, tell us a little bit about the work that you and, and Luca did and what those indices are, what they represent and why they're really valuable, kind of that one of those foundational infrastructure tools uh, for institutional engagement. Um, sure, I'd be happy to. So, um, you know, it's really interesting when we started having our conversations uh, about building crypto indices, um, we, uh, you know, sort of looked long and, and hard for the right uh, price provider, because I think the one thing that, you know, we now in hindsight, at least those who have been deep, knee deep in the space sort of forget is how decentralized this industry is, right? But if you really think about it, how many exchanges there are, right? There's peer-to-peer, peer-to-peer exchanges, there's OTC desk, there's all sorts of that stuff. So what we really needed to bring sort of transparency uh, to the market were indices. And what we really needed to do to bring transparency to the indices themselves was transparent pricing. So we were thrilled to work with Luca as a, as a, as a price provider for these indices um, because they had a, you know, a clearly defined methodology that would help us sort of get a real, um, at least a, a, an executable price for our indices. Um, and then of course the indices themselves, we started launching in May. We have uh, two single coin indices, one that's measuring the price of Bitcoin, another that's measuring the price of Ether. We have what we call the mega cap uh, index, which is measuring both. Then we have a large cap index, which is the larger end of the market. And finally, we sort of have the, the broad digital market, which we think represents the, the investable uni universe of crypto, similar to uh, the BMI, right? The broad market index that, that exists for equities. Um, and then everything sort of hangs off that framework. Nick, I, I just want to, let me turn to you. I wanted to build on that. And I think one of the things that also gets lost in, in this kind of dialogue, particularly with our colleagues that are on the technology side of crypto, is, is the challenge, Sharon, to your point, of putting together indices like that. And we, the three of us come from a world where, you know, there's, there's a unified tape for equity quotes, for example. There's kind of, a, I don't want to oversimplify that, but it's a bit easier to get some of that data to create some of those indices. Nick, can you can you peel that back a little bit, what those challenges were, how Luca worked on that and what that might look going forward as different tool sets and the infrastructure build out? Yeah, it'd be a pleasure. Uh, we, we absolutely take a lot of things for granted in traditional, you know, traditional financial ecosystem. Um, but but we also forget it's taken decades and decades and decades for that ecosystem to to get to this present state. So by the time most of us entered into into financial world, you know. New York Stock Exchange started what in 18th century, beginning of 19. You know, it's been a long time to build up all this infrastructure. You know, I think the first ticker tape was introduced in 19th century, mid 19th century. So, you know, so whereas you know, crypto ecosystem is only a few years. I mean, not even decades for a few years old. But, but, but yeah, absolutely, it's, it is very challenging. As you know, Sharon said, there is literally hundreds of venues you can trade Bitcoin or and other assets on, right? Um, there's, there's, there's dozens and dozens of major exchanges. Then there's OTC desks and there's, there's, um, now there's DEXs, decentralized exchanges on all, all sorts of ways to, to, to trade crypto. Um, but if you then look at traditional literature for gap for accounting and, you know, and, and, and tax purposes and such, like, or, or if you're a hedge fund, for example, you want to close your books, um, uh, or, or, or have an index fund, for example, you know, you, you, you very frequently would like in, in gap literature, we talk about the closing price on the primary exchange. That's a very normal thing to reference. Well, there is no primary exchange for Bitcoin and never will be. And, uh, and they never close. None of them ever close. And so, so just very basic things like that just starts breaking down very, very quickly. So what we've done at, at Luca is we, we built Luca to be very, from the very beginning to be institutional quality. That's literally what we hang our hat on, the institutional quality. We're building the entire company specifically, you know, to support partners like SP in the in, in their um in 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 their needs from institutional quality perspective. That's literally what we what we what we started with. And then the way we solved that specific problem is we developed this unique methodology, work with universities and 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 student setters and luminaries to 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 figure out how we can create a pricing source that actually does fit with with accounting you know, uh, approaches and, 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 and tax and so on. And, 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 and yet, um, meet the highest standards of transparency, independency, quality, like all those, those things that you would truly expect, you know, to, to be able to, you know, to support a partner like S and P. And so, and so we developed this methodology where in a nutshell, um, we, out of many, many, many exchanges in real time, we pick the, the a primary one, but not the primary forever, but just primary for that specific point in time and then we deliver the actual price actual traded price of 
an actual asset on that exchange at that point in time. So you don't get an average, you don't get an index, you don't you don't get a pre-calculated, you get an actual transaction that then would then you know be used to 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 feed an, an, an index with all the quality controls checks and and um, and to manipulation checks and and price oversight you know um, m- machinery around it to make sure it meets the highest quality. Nick, Sharon, I wanted to, and, and thank you for that, Nick. I want to dive into that a, l- a little bit more. And one of the things, you know, yeah. coming out of the world of institutions that we know, it, it, there used to be the day where retail was kind of, we were less worried about throughput and capacity, but in the world of Robinhood, uh, I think that's converging a little bit. But when we talk about the institutional engagement, what's that next evolution of that infrastructure looking like? Nick, you spoke to the challenge of bringing together those data sets. I would argue there's even deeper challenges that you you would both know around normalization of data, uh, things like tick data, et cetera, et cetera. What are those next steps to get to what I would call institutional, I don't want to overuse the phrase buy-in, but buy-in on how the infrastructure exists to allow institutions across the spectrum to engage. What do those next steps look like for, for both of your organizations? Sharon, do you want to start? Oh, Nick looked like he went off mute first, so I was going to let him chime in. <laughs> Please, up to you. I insist. Okay. Um, you know, it's it's interesting. I mean, there's definitely a lot um, that needs to happen. You know, I think at the broadest level, again, it's something we take all we all take for granted being in the traditional financial services environment and really having that driven driven home to us all those times. I mean, just really the idea of good governance, right? And, and what that means, right? Good risk management, technology risk, operational risk, managing all that stuff, you know, understanding the regulations, you know, and that's sort of speaking at a very broad level uh, for that. And I think, um, I mean, there's so much exciting that's happening here, but right, for institutions to really sort of uh, jump in a little more deeply, um, you know, we need to see more of that. I would say, you know, when I look at the products that we're releasing, I would say that custody um, is really an area that's still very fluid right now and is super important because, again, you know, it may be that I'm comfortable, you know, holding my my assets, um, you know, on a wallet and, and holding my keys, but my own private keys. But for an institution, when they're safeguarding other people's assets, right, there really needs to be the right policies in place. There right needs to be the right uh, operational controls, um, technology, right, you know, whether it's MPC or multi-sig, stuff like that, that I think is going to really be required before um, institutions feel comfortable holding, holding assets. And, and that doesn't even talk about the regulations, but I'll stop there. And we definitely have a bullet point on that. We've got an entire panel on it uh, as panel number one. But Nick, I'd love you to add on to that. And then again, you know, that perspective on where does the rest of the infrastructure evolution go? Uh, and what are those points we need to discuss? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's, it, is, it is happening in front of us, though. Like, the, that's first the good news, that it's definitely happening. And it's happening, I, I see, from both ends. So the, the crypto native firms are becoming you know, moving in the direction of looking more and more like what is more considered the norm in, in the traditional Wall Street financial world. And, and then also the traditional super large banks and giant money managers and, and so on are also moving in that direction slowly with appropriate, you know, checks and balances taking their time. But like, it's actually happening from both sides. And that's, that's really exciting. It's, re- it's really exciting to see. And, you know, I completely agree with Sharon. Some of the, some of the things that um, that are necessary to develop, and it it is happening in front of us. Is is you know, Sharon mentioned risk management, for example. You know, that's such a huge pillar of what traditional finance is, um, and 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 that needs to work its way through because the banks, risk committees, and in large firms, not just banks, but large firms, risk committees need to get comfortable. The boards need to get comfortable. Some of the machinery needs to needs to like propagates through. So, for example. Um, you know, the risk models need to be adjusted, how you calculate VAR and stress and some of the other things that, that, that need to be adjusted for crypto assets. Um, and then from the crypto native firms, this, the same thing, you know, we've seen, you know, one big IPO, uh, obviously Coinbase and then many others are coming and, but to, as part of that, there's, there's a, there's a big maturation process that that's happening. And so those firms are, are adopting certain risk frameworks. And so it, it is happening in front of us. That's the really good news. Um, and you can kind of see the little bit of the, the near-term roadmap because it because um, those worlds do need to come together from both sides. Um, and, and as Sharon said, like the traditional firms need to get comfortable with concepts like MPC and like, you know, and get that through risk committees and so on. But it is happening. I'm, I'm, I'm very optimistic. 
Nick, I, I, let me stick with you for a minute because you raised something really interesting. I, I kind of want to turn that around because you, you, you referenced it here and you raised the really interesting point of, of crypto native firms keeping data and information uh, and being part of that infrastructure on chain. And you talked about um, what I'll call classic financial services firms engaging blockchain uh, and keeping that data and information on chain as well. Is that kind of what you're alluding to here? Is that how you see that evolving over time or are we looking at something more basic? No, I was actually even 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 more basic than this because even if you might be transacting on chain, but but actually a lot of the transactions are off chain. A lot of the transactions are on exchanges, uh, and then the the blockchain is just the settlement mechanism. You know, at, at the end of you know you might do a whole bunch of transactions on the exchange, and then net amount you might move at the end of the day or something like that. So so it doesn't have to be on chain, although a, a whole lot of transactions do happen on chain OTC trades and and, and so on, and of course the distributed exchanges, but. Um, uh, but but yeah, it, it's a completely new world for the traditional institutions. I mean, they're compliance officers, they're risk officers, they're boards of directors, um, they're regulators, of course, let's not forget the regulators, all need to get comfortable with, with these things and their risk models need to get adjusted and their everything from disaster recovery and BCP plans, all sorts of things that we kind of like, you know, glance over, but there's the, a the vast amount of machinery that, that, that needs to be, um, you know, needs to be adjusted to include those sort of concepts. And it just takes time, but it is happening. That's, the, that's really good news. Let, let's, uh, you know, it's funny you raised the regulators. Let's let's pivot there a little bit. And I, for those like the three of us who've been involved in financial markets, I'm, I'm probably going to use some phrases, Sharon, that's going to make our head, the hair on our heads stand up a little bit. But um, very specifically, remember all of the work we had to do back when I was in financial markets around best execution reporting or uh, 605, 606 compliance reporting. And again, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to spend too much time on the regulatory. I know David's going to have a wonderful panel later on. But I, I wonder whether or not there's an awareness within the crypto ecosystem about over time how important those kind of regulatory reporting capabilities will be. Do you see it developing that way? And, and, and you know, I don't want to ask Sharon, will we see a best ex, best execution metric for crypto? But is that where it's going? And that's is that where it needs to go for institutional engagement? Hmm. And that that's a really, I mean, that's a really interesting question. Um, you know because th that has to do with so much of the way the traditional financial services operated, right? And how there were, I don't want to use the word, you know, sort of backhand deals or some people got more preferential treatment and all that stuff, right? Which a lot of us, you know, had objections against and I'm sure some people profited very richly from, right? It works both ways. Um, I, I think in the crypto universe, you know, it's true. I mean, there's so much of an emphasis on, uh, you know, being trustless, right? Um, where, where you're trying to remove a lot of that, that bias that might have existed in traditional financial services. So on one hand, I would say, well, maybe there's less of a need. Um, but at the same time, you know, when we look at the way um, trading works or exchanges operate and you look at the fees and you look at the fees, um, uh, you know, the way uh, miners are charging or whether, you know, all the sort of Ethereum um, protocol advancements, right, how that's going to change the pricing. I do think there might be a place for it in the future, certainly, because the yeah. fees are so huge and variable. Yeah. Nick? Hey, if I may add, I, I, I agree with all that. And I would just add, um, I, I just to fast forward a little bit further into the future, so this is not a comment about the immediate the future, but but you know, a few years from now, I just see the world's converging, including rules like five, 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 five or six. I just don't see them being applied here and not there. I just, I, it's going to take years and years. I'm not predicting this like tomorrow or, or next year, but but eventually, I think we'll only have one financial system, not two. We won't have like the digital assets and and everything else. I think eventually it'll be just just we just think of it as as financial financial assets, and and therefore. I, I think it'd be very Ill illogical to not have something, some way of bringing them together. So, so, so specifically five, five, five or six, like today, before we even can even discuss this, there is no NBBO for, for crypto and I'm not sure there will ever be, but, 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 but maybe, um, but there's a lot of like steps like this um, that needs to be developed. And that's part of what's happening here. The indices are being developed and, you know, index funds are coming out, you know, so they, these are all like necessary building blocks. Eventually the SEC will, will, discuss whether the national market system should or should, or should not apply to some of the crypto prices. Okay, I, I just think it's inevitable. And I also think we'll end up with one financial system um, with, with the rules converging. I don't know how it's gonna play out, but, um, but I, I, that, that part I'm, I'm actually very, very certain about. There will only be one. 
Right. Nick, thank you. Uh, Sharon, Nick, I wanted to raise one thing as well. In our prep session, we talked about, and you both raised this really interesting point, that we're looking at the emergence of a new kind of digital ecosystem, that the, 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 the pace of innovation uh, is accelerating. So um, we can go for hours and we have other events around DeFi and NFTs and CBDCs and stable coins. How are, how are Luca and S&P uh, reacting to that pace of innovation? How are you reacting? And can, to the extent you can share, what does the roadmap for your engagement in that ecosystem look like over time? And, and how might those ecosystems uh, need to evolve? And again, DeFi, you know, Sharon, to your reference earlier, not easy stuff from a, a you know a peer-to-peer -peer interoperation perspective. That's not the financial world we know. So I'd love some perspective on on kind of the roadmap for both of your organizations. Sharon, you want to kick off? Sure, why not? Um, yeah, I think you know to to sort of echo um, you know what Nick said. Right, there's in the future there's not going to be this schism between uh, you know sort of DeFi and CeFi or DeFi and and traditional banking. So. You know, one of the areas uh, to that point is that we're looking at are really how to tokenize other assets, right? How to tokenize, um, you know, index funds, right? That are based on equities or whatnot, right? Because if you think about as the as the two infrastructures collide, you have to have a seamless way to transfer between crypto and your stable coins and also equity. So I think, you know, certainly the rise of um, tokenized assets um, is you know it's happening already and it will only continue to happen. Um, the other area for us at S and P, which we're spending a lot of time on, um, is oracles, right? Um, because we we were you know we're big on uh, IP and data here, right? And and data is sort of key to this new ecosystem. So it's all about how how are the multiple ways we want to get our assets on chain to make them available um, to people. So that's sort of what we're focusing. You know, some of the sort of the near term things we're focusing on. Thank you, Sharon. Nick, anything you wanted to add that from a, from a roadmap perspective? Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. There's an incredible amount of innovation happening in 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 the blockchain space, and and um, and that's super exciting. Like, it really, really is exciting. It's like, it, you know, it, it's like the whole industry is a kind of in a startup mode, which is which is incredible. The the, the pace of innovation is so much faster, um, and I think it's really healthy for the economy and the and the broader financial system too, frankly, because because this is a place to do innovation. At an accelerated pace, and then, and then gradually spread out through the bigger, you know, big bigger ecosystem. But, but specifically, um, yeah, DeFi is 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 introducing lots of new data challenges for our clients, and frankly, we delight in that. We 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 love to solve our clients' data challenges. That's literally what we what we're here. And so, yeah, so we embrace the the challenges of DeFi and NFTs and some of the you know some of the innovations taking there's lots of interesting developments happening multiple chains and um lots of people are trying different different approaches to this um and all that creating complexity in data like both post-trade data and like accounting challenges and tax challenges and you know mark to market challenges all sorts of all sorts of interesting problems to solve and and we've literally delight in solving those problems for our clients so so all of that is on our roadmap. The other thing I just want to just just maybe highlight a little bit is is a lot of risk products uh, on the roadmap mm -hmm. as well because some of these innovative uh, approaches to financial transactions definitely create new and interesting risk management challenges. Like what does it even mean to have a smart contract that locks up some tokens and does something with them and then later does something else with them? How do you model it? How do you risk manage it? How do you do accounting for it? How do you do taxes for it? How do you do like it's a, it's a fascinating problem to solve and and as I said we delight in solving it. Thank you. Thank you both. And for anyone in the audience, if you have any questions for, for Nick or Sharon, uh, we do have a few, just a few minutes left. Please put them in the chat. Nick, Sharon, I wanted a, a little bit of a curveball, and, and I don't mean it to be, and I'm sure you'll both reach out to me afterward and, and properly yell at me. Um, but you mentioned oracles. Uh, and Sharon, one of the things that we've been very much focused on with our members and our colleagues really are the concerns and challenges around understanding what I'll broadly call the audit of the technology behind smart contracts and audit and on oracles. Um, how do you know? How does S&P look at this, Nick? How does Luca look at this from the perspective of things like interoperability? Is is are we at a point where we don't yet have the discipline and capability to fully audit some of these oracles and smart contracts? And you see that in the latest, um, you know, one smart contract was act for a hundred million or something. As we evolve and into an in institutional engagement, is that a greater and greater concern over time? Go ahead, Sharon. No, no, go. She's just waiting All for you. you. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, th these are very valid concerns. I mean, um, I mean, at the end of the day, smart contract is just computer code. 
Um, they tend to be simpler, frankly, than 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 the really complex applications we use day to day, because by definition they, you know, they execute much slower and relative. They, they tend to do relatively few things. They just need to do them correctly and well. I, I think there's a lot of lot of, lot of, lot of innovation in trying to audit it. It is a real concern. It's real, you know, real. Um, consideration. I think we're still in early stages of becoming really good at that, at auditing them and validating them. And um, not that not because there hasn't been a lot of works done in, in in that field. It's just still it's only been years, not decades. You know, and it's a very valid need. And and um, but it, I do think it's being being addressed. Um, we have seen some high profile hacks. Uh, I'm sure we'll see more in higher profile hacks. You know, if it's a computer code written by humans, there is a possibility of an error for sure. You know, humans are fallible, but um, um, but at the same time, I also see this as, as very natural for this vibrant new 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 economy. Like mistakes will be made and they'll be fixed, and we'll learn from it. And so, like to me, that's not a negative. I just see this as a as natural part of growth with with a few missteps and you know corrections, and you know we'll learn from it. Great, thank you both. We've only only got a couple of minutes. I, I wanted to ask, and I, I promised you both I wouldn't ask for predictions. Uh, so I won't use the word uh, in the next question, but what are your expectations, if that's a better word, Sharon, um, for 2022 and beyond? What do you, both from the perspective of the work that you do within your organizations, um, perspectives on uh, regulatory landscape, it's a bit of a difficult landscape, I know we're going to talk about that as well, and this idea of new instruments coming out. Do you want to speak a little bit to what the, your expectations are for 2022 uh, and beyond? Sharon, can we start with you? Sure. Um, right. And good for not using the word predictions, because we all know I'm not <laughs> able to to predict things. But I, I'm, I'm certainly optimistic, you know, as as Nick has certainly highlighted, you know, sort of throughout. I mean, there's so much interesting stuff that's going on. It really is a generational opportunity to see financial services reinvented. And that in itself is so exciting. Um, so I think just the the pace of innovation, the amount of innov innovation um, that's here, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll see new products uh, come to market very soon and really just broaden um, the, the audience of people who can participate in this new market. Um, I'm excited to see that. Sharon, thanks. Nick, final word from you, my friend. Um, I will make a prediction. Yes. Um, I will predict that whichever coin has the biggest market cap seven years from now doesn't exist yet. And that's not because Bitcoin or Ethereum or any of the others will disappear or anything else. I just think the pace of innovation is so incredible that there will be even, even bigger things coming that hasn't, have not happened yet that will be transformational to how we, how, we, how we do business on this planet and how we do commerce on this planet. And, 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 and I'm not picking anywhere. I literally don't think, I actually, I really don't know. And I think that's super exciting, and and it's an incredible, it's a privilege to be part of build, you know, helping build something so new and and and, and transformational to how commerce happens on this planet. So, uh, but I'll, I'll, I, I'm happy to make one prediction too as a as a closing statement. Predictions, it is. Thank you, Nick. Nick, if people want to learn more about Luke and what you're doing, where should they go? Sharon, I'll give you the same question likewise. Yeah, uh, if you go to Luca.tech, uh, L-U-K-K-A.T-E-C-H. Um, that's that's our website, or you can you're very very welcome to reach out to me. I'm I'm sure there'll be some contact information on you know. Nick, thanks so much, Sharon. If people want to find out what you're doing over at S and P and how to get in touch, yeah, S and P uh, spglobal.com. We have a new white paper out which people might want to take a look at, and uh, certainly can email me too. Excellent, Sharon. We'll be sharing the white paper through the newsletter to members as well. Sharon, Nick, it's such a privilege to have you part of the WSBA. Thank you for being part of this conversation. Hope you can stick around for the rest of the sessions. I know the rest of our panelists are queuing up. Uh, I am now going to give it a moment or two, get off camera because you don't need to see me anymore. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mr. David Brill, the chair of our crypto asset working group, who will be headlining the new panel. Nick and Sharon, thank you once again. David, over to you. Great, Ron. Thanks, uh, first of all, for this great fireside chat. It's really interesting to hear what SP and Luca are doing. And as the space evolves and more players get in the space, it's great to see the opportunities that exist for those players. So I have the great pleasure of moderating this all star cast of crypto lawyers, really experts, both from the in house and from the you know, law firm perspective, we're gonna have a really dimensional look at some of the top crypto issues in our space. 
So I'm just going to briefly, for those who don't know me, I am David Brill. I'm chair of the Crypto Assets Working Group at Wall Street Blockchain Alliance. I'm also head commercial counsel at Voyager Digital. And many of you probably have seen me in this space. Um, I helped bring Ether to the first regulated exchange here in the US and other big projects in the space. Um, I'm going to ask Kayvon, Lewis, Rebecca, and Alexander to introduce themselves, and then we're going to jump right in. Sure, because it sounds like I go first. Uh, I'm Kayvon Sadegi. I'm a litigator in the blockchain space, primarily. I've got a securities litigation and commercial litigation background and got into the blockchain space about five years ago now and have known, I think, most of the other panelists uh, pretty much that long since we've all been in the space and uh, do a combination of helping people try to navigate um, our you know, system of enforcement uh, and regulation by enforcement, as well as other various litigation that comes up in the, in the crypto space and trying to keep people out of it when they come talk to me early enough. Great, Lewis? Uh, sure, thanks. Um, my name is Lewis Cohen. I'm a co-founder of DLX Law, which is a boutique law firm with offices in New York, Wilmington, Delaware, and Washington, DC. And we focus a lot on clients in the digital asset space. Rebecca? Sure. Uh, my name is Rebecca Reddig. I'm the general counsel at the Ave Companies. We're a group of software development companies based in Europe that develop open source blockchain-based software, uh, the most well known of which is called the Ave Protocol, a centralized liquidity protocol. Uh, uh, I have been working in the um, blockchain space for about four and a half years doing litigation, regulatory enforcement, and like Kayvon, sort of regulatory counseling um, as to best practices and things like that. Uh, and um, now I'm here continuing to build this amazing Web3 world. Great. Thank you, Rebecca. Alexandra. Hi, thanks, David. I'm Alexandra Scheib. I run the FinTech and Blockchain Group at McDermott, Will & Emery. Like all the panelists, I got into the blockchain world about five years ago. Um, I'm originally a derivatives and structured finance lawyer, so I primarily focus on transactional and regulatory advice and strategy from the, the product side and the, and the financial transaction side. We meet with regulators all the time and we, and we structure products for you know, ongoing new, new blockchain platforms. Great. Well, there's a wealth of knowledge here and I am glad to ask some very uh, hard-hitting questions of this group and see what their thoughts are. So Kayvon, SEC Chairman Gensler last week in a remark to the Securities Enforcement Forum said the following. So if you're asking a lawyer, accountant or advisor, if something is over the line, maybe it's time to step back from the line. Remember that going up to the edge of a rule or searching for some ambiguity in the text or a footnote may not be consistent with the law or its purpose. What do you think about that? Yeah, I, I think the, yeah, it may be that what he intended was more narrow than the way it comes across. I think the way it comes across is very problematic, particularly in the, in the blockchain space, just because I think we have a lot of clients who come to us and really aren't sure where the lines are and they don't understand what they're allowed to do and not allowed to do. And you know, my advice would almost be the opposite uh, in this space, which is that even if you don't think you're close to the line, you should go speak to a lawyer to try to figure out where the, where the lines are because there are people who are surprised at where the lines are all the time. And, and we're all guessing, you know, even the concept of a line, I think is a bit um, you know, of a misnomer because there isn't really a clear line. And so, so I think the entire space is arguably close to the line. And that doesn't mean all of you know, the digital asset ecosystem should be shut down or people should just back away. I think it's, it's sort of incumbent upon this industry to explore where that, that line is and should be. Lewis, what do you think? It's a great answer um, from, from Kevon. I would maybe just add to it that um, it's important to remember that you know, under US law, many of our rules are principles-based. And as you know, just to really elaborate on, on Kevon's point, 
uh, principles don't have lines. That's the nature of being principles. And, 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 and we have a system of law like that specifically to avoid people going up to lines. Many civil law jurisdictions do have very, very bright line tests. And you know, it's often remarked that that encourages this. So I think we do need counsel, as Kevon says, to assist clients in understanding it's less of a line and more of kind of a cloud and how to navigate through the cloud. And that's what, you know, counsel, you know, such as ourselves and, and many other wonderful and excellent lawyers in the space seek to do. So Alexander, when you think about your clients, uh, how does this strike you when you think about your practice? I, you know, I guess a couple of points and just I agree with Kayvon and, and Lewis, but you know, just as a reminder, you know, there are certainly clients, and I think we all have them, who are really trying to do the right thing in this space. And I think perhaps maybe unintended, that quote was read as thinking there are people trying to avoid regulation. And what I really think is that people are trying to get it right. And there's so much uncertainty that the reason that we're all talking and they come to talk to us is that they're looking for a strategy and a path forward because they really believe in their business and they want to do the right thing. And sometimes in this space, that means taking a certain amount of risk because there is regulatory uncertainty, but it certainly doesn't mean that people are trying to per se evade the law. You know, Rebecca, I'm curious on your take, and then uh, I want to talk to you about something that Commissioner Crenshaw said. So first, uh, what, what's your take on uh, Gensler's comments? Uh, my take, I think everybody, you know, said it very well here, but, you know, there's a line for a reason, you know, you can't cross it, but you can certainly come up to the line um, as long as you're acting in good faith and have, as everybody here said, great legal counsel. Uh, um, who's helping you navigate those waters. Generally, both when I was in private practice and here, I, my decisions are always informed by, am I acting in good faith? If I ever had to defend this particular practice, can I say we're a good actor in the space? The line was gray, but we certainly took all the information we had and made a good informed decision to ensure we were acting appropriately. Um, and so that's really what I'd respond, which is, there are so many, and maybe Kayvon had a great tweet thread, or we talked about this the other day, but it's like, there are plenty of people to go after in the crypto space who are, not plenty, but there are certainly frauds and things like that. But for the rest of us who are actually trying to be good actors and trying to navigate the gray area and figure out exactly where the line may be, let's just give some clarity, explain where the line is, and then we can all continue on in our merry way. The SEC won't be overtaxed and the rest of us will continue being good yeah. Well, you know, I will say that uh, this came from Kayvon, but I, I did feel like this was a little bit of a brushback pitch to uh, lawyers and other professionals in the space. And uh, look, I think the fundamental part of our laws are that, you know, there are opportunities to you know, look at them differently, see the precedent, and then argue forcefully for your position. And so I don't think we ever want to be in a place where we can't do that as part of our society. And then, you know, an independent arbiter makes a conclusion on that. And so I think that's just in a very important principle that you know, we all need to abide by to support the rules that you know, govern our country. Um, I ask David, have you just coined that, that this is the Sal Magley approach to regulation? <laughs> and that joke, that joke is probably going to hit one out of about 50, but uh, yeah, maybe look it maybe. up if you don't. <laughs> No, no, I know, I know, but for uh, the, the rest of the folks, yeah, it, it's funny. It, it's true. It very much could be true. Um, Rebecca, I'm going to pivot to you now. Uh, yesterday, uh, SEC Commissioner Crenshaw, I'm going to read what she said, urged DeFi market players on Tuesday, yesterday, to voluntarily comply with the securities regulations by clearly disclosing market risks to investors warning that she expects more SEC enforcement actions against those who do not. So first of all, I'm curious to know what you think. And, and what do you think is, you know, what do you think is appropriate disclosure when you look at your company just generally in the DeFi space overall? So I read um, Commissioner Crenshaw's article, I guess, with great interest. I'll say the positive first, which was, the tone was much, much better than anything else coming out of the 
SEC to date. And I do believe she's pro innovation and wants to make sure we're not stifling uh, innovation. Um, so I, I think that's a positive. I think that she has clearly spoken to some um, participants in the market and others who have knowledge. And so she seems to understand certain aspects of the DeFi space. But I think there are two, if at least two real issues with her statement. One, everything she said that was a problem in the DeFi space is still a problem in the traditional financial market. So to say, oh, we should regulate DeFi and work to make it exactly like the traditional financial markets is wrong. Like, are, are we going to be honest that there's no information asymmetry? Uh, I mean, are wealthy actors in the traditional financial markets not more rewarded? Um, so I just... I just think that was very problematic. Um, and I think then she overlooked some real um, benefits in the DeFi space in what she was talking about. So with respect to information asymmetries, VCs or whales who hold more tokens um, and things like that uh, definitely do not necessarily have more advantages than retail investors who are holding tokens. And first of all, her first point on information asymmetry was not about DeFi, it was about digital assets and tokens. Um, but I do think that, and I and I, I will say, she said, you know, well, regular people can't read code, but you don't necessarily need to read code um, in order to understand the way that the DeFi markets work. You need to be able to maybe understand Etherscan, um, and to see how transactions are happening and things like that. But lots of these DeFi protocols have docs pages or these, these software developers who put out protocols have docs pages. Some are for developers. Okay, I, you know, I may not be able to read that as well as a, you know, someone with a deep software development background, but I can certainly read the docs pages that explain how things work uh, in the protocol for either our protocol, Compound, Uniswap, they all have docs pages out there. So that's on the information asymmetry point um, and the disclosure. Um, but I also think that um, the transparency, the there's a second point she made um, and I just lost the second point, but it was the information asymmetry. What was her other point? Sorry, I saved it. About disclosures, we were talking about the- Oh, money. same thing. Oh, so what is appropriate disclosure? Okay, I don't think we have to make the code readable for everybody. Maybe we need to have a standardization of what the docs pages include. And maybe we need to have a standardization of what risks are disclosed. That's fine, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. That's the same standardization in the traditional financial markets. And I don't think that, um, I think this concept, and she's not the first person to bring it up to say like, well, if we can't read code, how can we understand to use it? It's like, you don't, you don't need to. I've, I've been talking, you know, talking to people in the DeFi space and or talking to sort of newbies, including my husband who was a Wall Street normie and is getting into crypto now. And it's like, just start using it, be careful. When you use it, start using it slowly. But if you use it, you'll have the same knowledge base as other people who have been using it. You may not as the deep software developers, but otherwise there is a normalization across users because of the access it has to lots of different people. Yeah, look, first I wanna reiterate by the way that all of our comments say are made in our personal capacities and not representing our firms or our companies. Uh, so Rebecca, I want to agree. I've used DeFi platforms. I am not a software developer, but I have figured them out. I've read the docs pages. I've played around with them and it's an iterative thing. And I totally agree. You know, you have to be careful and be thoughtful and follow the directions. The UI is still evolving and it will still continue to evolve. But uh, I also push back at the notion that you need to be an engineer or, or some computer science person to have that level of uh, expertise. Yeah, uh, I just thought the comments were positive, but myopic. Yeah. I, I, I think just, just to add, so sorry, Kayvon, you wanna go ahead? No, 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 after you, after you. I was gonna say, I agree with everything Rebecca said, but I, but I really wanted everybody to weigh in. I think the disconnect with DeFi is that Commissioner Crenshaw and others, really have an idea that they need to find, you know, an issuer or a proprietor or a legal entity that they can hold responsible, both for the risk disclosure, for the information, they're looking for a responsible party. And we know that, you know, 
you know, functional DeFi really shouldn't have one single controlling entity. And that's just a real disconnect in the regulation right now. And some of these disclosure and information points are really driving towards holding a person responsible for, for those disclosures. Yeah, I think that's a I think that's a great point. What I was going to jump in with is that again, this goes back to what the point Rebecca made, which is that you could say a lot of the same things about the conventional financial industry. Right? Very few people in the sort of retail investing space know what to do with the annual report. You know, know what know what to do with a cash flow statement or an income statement or how that relates to anything else. And that this is not designed for retail investing, but the idea is if the right information is disclosed, there are people who are incentivized and who are capable of understanding it in the market and overall the market will digest the information. And so it'll be appropriate. And if there's a misstatement, you know who to go after. I think Alexander's exactly right. The problem here is they haven't figured out who they would want to go after. And they also don't know what the relevant information is that needs to be disclosed because it's not the same disclosures that would be relevant for a public company. Those just aren't the relevant pieces of information in order to evaluate this. Maybe it is the code, it's not the balance sheet, something like that. You know, there, there are going to be different, different elements of disclosure, but figuring out what those are supposed to be and who the right person is, is difficult. And until you figure that out, trying to just say comply with the existing regulations, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Lewis, you have any thoughts before we move on? No, really just to concur with those those observations and then particularly, you know, Rebecca and David, to your point that that, you know, reading code is not, um, you know, shouldn't be a, a, a mandate. You can only, in, in fact, I might argue you you create more confusion if you try and have sort of a, a, a side by side version in, you know, English language, because what if that doesn't match what the code does and then are we misleading people? So I think that that actually, you know, in perhaps well intended, but, you know, could actually introduce more risk um, into the oh. ecosystem. So the next question, um, Lee Schneider, who's the general counsel of Alva Labs is a good friend of mine. And he and I were talking and he asked this question. He says, does the nature of the asset matter? Does it matter for utilization, valuation or for legal classification, you know, for regulatory purposes? What kind of asset matters more and more as they are increasingly differentiated by use? You know, how they offered for sale may or may not make such an arrangement an investment contract. Uh, Lewis, what is your view regarding how assets are characterized? Well, it's a, it was a great question Lee posed and, uh, you know, he, you invoke his name and he's really one of the OG uh, lawyers in the space and um, uh, definitely deserves a lot of shout outs there. Um, it was a great question. I, mean, it, it, I guess I'd answer very quickly in, in, in two parts because it, it depends like so many other things, what, what, what your um, purpose is. If your purpose is, is characterizing a digital asset in uh, existing legal or regulatory scheme, the the characteristics do matter a lot. They're 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 essential. Um, if we're trying to understand the how digital assets are being used in the broader sense, um, there's an open endedness um, in in many digital assets that I think bespeaks you know the creativity of their users. And you know one thing I'd cite are are NFTs that. Uh, like the Board 8 Yacht Club that have become communities in and of themselves, which, you know, on the one hand, you say, gosh, it's a, it's a digital asset that points at a JPEG, who cares? But it's created a whole kind of world around uh, that community of people who find that fascinating, who have, you know, been spinning it out into other things. And so um, some of the characteristics of digital assets sometimes are actually created as as we go by the communities of the people that use them. And to me, that's that's very exciting, very enriching. And I think Rebecca, you had, you know, kind of alluded to Web three as you know an important step forward. I, th I think this very much characterizes Web three, which is very much of a of a ground up, a user up rather than a top down from a Silicon Valley corporate entity telling you how to do things or how to view things, it's a user base up. Well, what can we do with this particular thing? And I, I find that very intriguing. Anyone else wanna jump in on that? Sure, I, mean, I guess the nature I'll, of the... I'll chime in. You go, Kayvon, yeah, go and then I'll, I'll... No, no, you go and then sure. I'll go okay. next. All right. 
Yeah, I was going to say, I think for some things, the nature of the asset matters a lot. Um, you know, obviously, there's certain assets that are pretty much on their face a, you know, derivative of a, of a security and people are tokenizing actual securities, things like that. I mean, there are there are tokens that are very clearly one sort of asset or another, um, and they're going to be treated as such. I think in another sense, it doesn't matter because as the SEC likes to point out, you can structure a securities offering around almost anything, whether it's an orange grove or a beaver or a barrel of whiskey. You know, you can structure a securities offering around almost anything. So in that sense, the nature of the token itself doesn't necessarily matter for determining whether the way it's offered fits into securities laws. But I think what we're really seeing is that the nature of the assets is blurring and there there aren't even clear buckets you can place things into. Now you're, you know, and I think we're going to see more and more convergence. We're going to see, you know, the, the NFTs and DeFi and gaming are all sort of blurring together. You know, I think, you know, Ave, they're, they're Avagochis now that are little ghosts that are, you know, sort of NFT, you know, you know, collectibles, but used for an online gaming, but they are sort of wrapped into DeFi and it's just not going to be easy to blur, you know, to, to bucket things as to the nature of the asset, you know, to begin with. So. Yes. And Avagachis are literally just like, well, then this goes to what I was going to say. That's a community uh, run thing that isn't associated with the Ave companies. We didn't start it up or any of those things. Um, that's something that just like is part of having a robust, decentralized ecosystem um uh but and i agree but i agree that the the nature of the digital asset uh, and how it was offered as kayvon said is is really important um and i think we probably talked about this in our prep session i've talked about this with lots of other people but you can't say that without doing a deep dive that 60 percent or almost all digital assets are securities these are facts and circumstances tests they're balancing tests um, and they're really specific. Uh, and if you're really gonna get into it, I mean, to think about what is um, essential entrepreneurial or managerial efforts under Howie versus what constitutes just like admin, um, which I think about, by the way, on a daily basis because the protocol is highly decentralized and there is very robust governance and we are decentralized away from the protocol. Um, but the question is still like, oh, can we reach out to this person about X or something like that? And, you know, you have to think about like, is that essential or is that just ministerial, something like that. Um, but the SEC should not be necessarily out there making, they have also gone into a deep um, facts and circumstances. We lost you a little bit there at the end, Rebecca, but we, we got the gist of it. Okay. Um, so my next question, I'm going to start with you, Alexander, for this one is, you know, why in all the rush to characterize digital assets themselves as security, there isn't the same amount of energy being expended by the commission to give market participants a means to comply if the arrangement whereby they are offered happens to make them a security. And, and I point to Commissioner Pierce's dissent in Poloniex. And I, I wonder out loud why the commission has been silent on the fact that if a token were determined to be a security, there are no liquid markets. Um, you know, security token exchanges don't really have deep liquidity yet for that token to trade and, and that that token would be restricted to accredited investors only. And this is a really important question for me personally because I really don't wanna see a whole generation of investors disenfranchised from crypto because they're not accredited investors. You know, while some of us are fortunate to be those, there are a lot of people who are very interested in the space who don't qualify. So it's really, uh, I think it's really important for, you know, the public at large, you know, when we talk about this subject. I, yeah, it's a, it's a great, it's a great question. And there, there are a number of different ways to think about it. And, and you're right, you know, the, aside from Commissioner Pierce, the the point of view of the SEC is a little bit short-sighted. You know, the, the big the, the big push is, you know, come in and, and register, register your tokens. Um, you know, we are our, our firm actually was fortunate enough to do one where we did write an S1 to do, you know, for, for one of our clients to register the tokens as securities. 
So those can be sold to anybody. But of all the projects, you know, we've worked with, there's been one and maybe a second one. And so it's not necessarily a path forward for all projects. And you're right, there hasn't been enough time and thought into how to have a successful infrastructure and an ongoing project if every transaction is a securities transaction. I know some of the some of us have been talking about this issue for, you know, four, four years, five years plus. And I don't know that we've made that much progress on it. I think another reason, and this sort of folds back into what everybody was talking about on our previous discussion, why people are so interested in some of the convergence of the products and what regulator is responsible is that, you know, I'm sure, you know, Lewis would agree with me. Some of these projects, you can tilt your head and say, well, maybe it's a security. No, it's a derivative. No, it's property. No, it's, it's you know, some, some kind of other transaction. And depending on how we classify, we would have more of a path forward with some regimes than others. But you're, you're right that there's a lot of work to do to structure successful products in the U.S. because, you know, this implementation has really, really been focused on the initial phase and nothing about standing up a platform, you know, for years to come. Anybody else want to weigh in on this one? I, I know I could talk about it for 20 minutes, but uh, I, uh, I, I value all of your opinions on this. I do think the important thing to think about is like there is this huge distinction and this goes to what we're talking about with um, Commissioner Crenshaw's speech is like people need to make sure, including regulators, that they are distinguishing between digital assets on the one hand and software protocols in which digital assets can work or through which they are created. So um, something like uh, the Uniswap protocol, you can use digital assets in it. It produces LP tokens, which are other types of digital assets, but the tokens that are used in it and the tokens produced by it are separate from what the protocol does. And those things need to be thought about separately. You know, and I'll also make the point that, you know, Chairman Gensler in his speech, you know, talked about, you know, zealous advocacy of, of lawyers and other professionals for their clients and where the line is. I think some of this zealous advocacy comes from the fact that it becomes a little bit of a zero sum game. So if you have a token and a protocol that is active, but uh, you know, a characterization, characterization as a security really takes the oxygen out of the token, the oxygen in the US out of the ability for people to use the token in different formats. And so I think in some ways it's become a little bit of a zero sum game. And, I think a lot of traction around the idea of a safe harbor, you know, makes sense in a way because it would give people an opportunity to continue operating in a way ideally so that that doesn't happen. You know, I, I will, when I think about Ripple and I'm not talking at all about the, the, the facts in the case, you know, 15 billion in market cap was wiped off of Ripple when uh, the complaint was brought by the SEC. And I feel like US investors were probably, or token holders were disproportionately affected by that. Because once um, the token was gonna to be delisted on exchanges, I think a lot of people sold it because they were concerned about holding it. And you know, I feel that while the Ripple case plays out, it feels like Americans really took the brunt of that loss in value. And, and it's something I think about when we talk about the space broadly and, you know, I understand that we want to have consumer protection, but at the same point, we don't want to, to you know, really hurt Americans who are involved in the space. So uh, something that I think about a lot. As we talk about the juxtaposition between how people are treated in the US and treated abroad, you know, um, Lewis, I'm gonna ask you this one. If a token project from outside the US approached you, regarding a distribution of tokens. Would you advise them to avoid US residents and any nexus to the US? Yeah, yeah, I would and I have and, and we do. And it's, you know, as I think we've all observed, it's it's kind of unfortunate. Um, you know, and I'll just tie my answer a little bit to another point um, and just to kind of elaborate on a point you made and 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 Rebecca, really all of us, but um, you know, in Crenshaw's speech, which, which is well-intended, there's no question, and I'm referring uh, not to her, talk on DeFi, her speech on DeFi most recently, but on um, 
her, her general response to the safe harbor. And in that, you know, you get the distinct impression that in her mind, you know, DeFi projects or token projects are just, you know, kind of like lazy or cheap or don't want to do the hard work. And, you know, others, you know, make the effort. And, and um, a, a common theme is, is with one that the new um, SEC general counsel, uh, Ross Benham made in a speech when he was still at the SEC, which is this idea of unfairness, you know, hey, it's just not fair. There's, you know, people doing the hard work and then, you know, there's these kind of, you know, slide under the, under the radar kind of folks. And, um, and that's just not correct. And I think we've all said that, but just to kind of call that out, um, there is no like come in and register if you want to have a decentralized project. Because by definition, the control person who's doing the registering then means that you don't have a decentralized project. You have somebody who's taking responsibility and control for the entirety of the thing. So, so there really isn't a path. So to circle back just then to your most immediate question, if you're a project that's not in the US anyway, um, you know, there's no particular good reason to, to come into the US. And the reality is that capital has migrated outside of the US and we're continuing to see that and talent is migrating outside the US. And people say, well, that's, you know, fair enough. You're not, we're not wanted here. We, we kind of got that message and, you know, we'll, we'll go somewhere else. And it's unfortunate for those of us who believe that innovation should be, you know, centered around the US and, and we kind of won the internet and we should be winning web three too, also. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Lewis. And, and I think um, I find it ironic and frustrating when you look at listings for tokens and the US is lumped in with China and sort of Syria and, and places where there's you know, heavy anti-money laundering and we're all lumped together as people who can't participate. It's a little frustrating for those who wanna see the growth and development of the space and participate in it. So there, there is some irony in all this as well. Um, so, you know, talking about current regulation, um, Rebecca, you know, some people would say that the, between the current administration, Congress, and the SEC, there's been a more aggressive stance towards crypto. How do you see the crypto community coming together and lobbying for changes, you know, or against changes that could harm it fundamentally, or just lobbying for uh, regulation that's equitable to people in the space? Uh, I think a couple of things. First, I don't think the aggressive stance is uh, unexpected. I think all knew that this was a battle coming once everybody sort of saw the promise and saw how fast uh, the DeFi space and the crypto space in general is growing. And there, I think it's undeniable that certainly in the last 18 months, um, many different parts of the, the Web3 ecosystem have really come to the floor, to the four DeFi, NFTs, um, and stable coins. It's telling me my internet connection is unstable, so I'm turning off my camera. Um, but I think I'm really proud of the Web3 slash crypto community. I think people are coming together in a really um, motivated way. Uh, I think there are lots of lobbyists in DC that are being mobilized to make sure that the lobbying is happening. I think the current ask that's going on, um, there's some specific legislation, but the other ask is a lot to the policymakers, not to regulators in particular, but to policymakers, slow down, learn about the technology, and let's work together to see what makes sense. So yes, maybe a robust disclosure regime does make sense, but in what way and on what topics and things like that. Um, so I think that the lobbying is going to go very hard. I think there are new organizations that are really being spun up that are intended to address these issues. There's CCI, there's the DeFi Education Fund. Obviously, the Blockchain Association has been around for a long time. Wall Street Blockchain Alliance has been doing its own work. Um, and so there are both OG uh, lobbyists and other trade organizations in the space, as well as new um, trade organizations or lobbying organizations. And then projects themselves are hiring lobbyists in order to go make a difference too. And so I see a lot of money being allocated towards this in order to make sure that there is not just responsible innovation, but responsible legislation um, and regulation around DeFi and Web3 in general. Thanks, Rebecca. Kayvon, you and I had the pleasure of speaking to some of the uh, 
you know, being down at, in DC and talking to some of, you know, a couple of senators offices and representatives offices. How, how do you see this evolving? Uh, I think we were down there two years ago and time has certainly flown. How have you seen this uh, evolving in the past couple of years and, and where do you see this going forward? Yeah, it was uh, hard to believe it's already been two years, uh, especially given that the world seems to have shut down largely uh, in, in between uh, in a lot of ways. I, in a lot of ways, I think the conversation is very similar to what it was two years ago in the political sphere in that, you know, what we were down there for was trying to educate people. It's not really lobbying, it's just trying to educate people and really ultimately as far as how we, you know, move the needle, I think that education is key. And I think a lot of the education points are still somewhat the same, which is, you know, there's a lot of noise around the potential harmful aspects, the money laundering component, the potential for crypto to be used for, you know, crime of one kind or another, uh, ransoms, et cetera. There's just less volume on the positive messages and the, just the uses of the technology and, and where it can benefit and the consequence of just trying to shut it down. This is not going to be shut down. It really is sort of like the evolution of the internet. Uh, you know, it's going to happen. It's a question of you know, what's the U.S.'s position in it and are we at the lead or are we excluding ourselves and then, you know, wishing we hadn't later when when the hub of innovation is somewhere else. So I think a lot of it is still that that dynamic. I think w one of the things that changed is just, you know, as Rebecca said, this area has scaled up very quickly. It's now hot again. And as it gains scale, you know, it's an order of magnitude bigger than it was when we were having that discussion two years ago, and that starts to raise a different kind of concerns for people. Now, there's a whole new crop of people, businesses, industries that feel threatened by this, that didn't feel threatened two years ago. And I think that's that, that's a major change. But you know, I think even people within those industries realize you, you can't necessarily stop it. There may be some people who want to slow it down until they can figure out how to profit from it or you know, other motivations. But yeah, I think people have gotten used to the idea that this isn't going to be entirely shut down. Yeah, you know, and something I want to add is, you know, there is a lot of, when we talk about regulation and sort of what's going on, there really is a lot of disclosure out there. And it may not be on different protocols, and it may not be packaged exactly the same way that people may, may be used to ingesting it, but it is there. And, you know, maybe there's a way that we collectively can make it more accessible to people. But I really think that protocols do a good job of of sharing disclosure and explaining risks. And, and I think that collectively, both you know, in the business community and in the regulatory community, there should be an appreciation for that and, and that it is ongoing and consistent. And uh, you know, I'm a believer that we will innovate in how we disclose. And I think it will look, start to look a lot closer to what people are used to seeing in, in other formats, even though I don't know anybody who really reads their perspectives anymore before they buy security, but not, not, notwithstanding that. Um, we have a ton of questions and only a few minutes left. So I'm gonna ask my last question and then we'll try to get a couple from the audience. Um, curious to know if anybody wants to weigh in on when they think we'll see a Bitcoin spot ETF approved in the US. All right, uh, Louis, you're shaking your head. Do you have any? Well, uh, only no. I, I'm only shaking my head because we could have. We, you know, the the depressing thing is, I think it was any day now for about two years. So, you know, I suspect we're we're still any day now. Well, if not quite any day now, but um, I'm obviously the futures ETFs suggest maybe things are changing, but um, uh, I think it's widely regarded the futures product, the futures-based ETF is, is not nearly as, as good a consumer product. And, you know, it does feel to many observers that, you know, it's approved because it's it's a way for regulators to be a little more distant from it rather than what's what's best for the investing community. But it's not an area that I follow that closely. So, I, you know, that's, I'll keep it there. Okay. Anybody else want to weigh in or uh, no? I'll tell you, having worked on one of the first Bitcoin uh, ETF filings back in 2016. I had high hopes that we would have had one by now. And, uh, you know, I do agree that I think the futures product isn't as consumer friendly as we'd all like. And, uh, you know, hopeful that we will see one soon. 
Uh, I'm looking through the questions from the audience. One really interesting one popped out first was, what do people think about a separate regulator for crypto? Is this a dead on arrival suggestion or is this something we think is workable and potentially doable in the near future? Yeah, I think one of the difficulties, it goes back to something Lewis said earlier. I mean, our system of regulation is, is principles-based. It's not line-based. It's also not technology-based. And I think it's very hard to set something up that's crypto-specific when you have um, you know, digital assets that can cut across with the mission of, of a variety of different regulators. I'm just not sure there's a solution to that. I think they need to coordinate. But at the end of the day, some digital assets will be used in investment schemes. Other ones really will operate much more like a commodity. There are others that you know will implicate other regulatory agencies. So I don't, I don't know that there's a way to bring that all within one umbrella without causing more friction and more confusion than, than it solves. Uh, another question that came in was, can anyone speak to OCC head Sue's comment that too much innovation in stable coins, et cetera, is a bad thing? I don't know if anybody has thoughts on that one. I can pick that up if anyone else um, is, is, is not. I mean, quickly, I, you know, I think it was really only a matter of time before we saw federal banking regulators stepping in um, on stable coins. Um, and I think in some ways, Although I don't agree with the, the the specific statement, I think the engagement from the OCC is a net positive in that it's just telling us how far stablecoins have come. That you know this is a very relevant topic, and the fact that we're worried about you know overall uh, stability of our financial system due to that uh, just tells you that we've 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 made real inroads, and I think it should be addressed. Um, you know. Payment rails are some of the most important aspects. It's kind of the lifeblood of our, of our economy. And, you know, you, you, you want there to be a high degree of care. Uh, you know, many have remarked, um, and, and I think I'm among them, that, you know, Europe has done very well with a regime that they refer to as e-money, which is, you know, sort of a stable coin without the coin, uh, but privately issued money that, that can be uh, where, where, where traditional fiat is, is paid over, invested in exceedingly secure um, instruments and then made available uh, more freely through a third party provider that is not a bank. And that's worked fine for them for you know, 15 or 20 years. So hopefully, you know, this is a step, albeit a slow one, in the right direction of engaging around stable coins and their place in the broader you know, payments ecosystems. Great. Well, you know, it's 3.15 now and this time has flown by. I've really enjoyed having the opportunity to speak with all of you about some really important topics in our field and really appreciate this. And I know the audience had a lot of questions that I couldn't get to, but uh, thanks again, everyone. And I hope people have enjoyed this. And uh, I'm gonna hand it back over to you, Ron. David, thanks so much. Lewis, Kayvon, Rebecca, Alexander, always a privilege. Thank you for, for uh, the conversation and being part of this all. We do have additional questions as well. Uh, we'll get them to all of you uh, going forward. We're going to take a two minute break, give everyone a time, an opportunity to step away and bring up our new panelists. But panel one, thanks again. David, as always, much appreciated. We'll be back here in two minutes. Take care. Thank you. Everyone. All right, Mr. Canty, good day, sir. Mr. Johnson, how are you? 
going to bring Mr. White on as well. And I think we're just waiting for Mr. Levecchio to join and then we will turn it over to you, Kel. It's, uh, I'm sorry, what was that? I was just mentioning we're just waiting for uh, one more person, uh, Mr. Levecchio to join and then we will, uh, I will turn the call over to you. Sounds good. So should I go with Pat and Pat or White and Levecchio? Hmm. You, you can ask Pat. We have one or two Pats on right now. You got the Pats on today. We're all we're all good. We I, go by, I go by Pat normally, but I, I respond to pretty much anything. So so if I say Pat for you and I say, well, I guess it's Pat Lavecchia. Um, hmm. You, you, can you? Me, you can call me Pat, Pat W or, or call me Bitwave. You can call me. I'll call you Pat W. How about yeah, that? All good. Go with Pat and Pat W. Sweet. Kel, I'm going to turn it over to you for panel number two. As soon as Mr. Levecki gets here, I will make him uh, put him into the panelist room. But uh, welcome to panel two, everyone. Mr. Canty, it is over to you, my friend. Great. Uh, thank you, Ron, and uh, glad to be here with everyone today. Uh, the second panel, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, more around the institutional adoption, um, a little bit around crypto, uh, DeFi, and uh, NFTs, as well as something that I I think it's been lost a little bit along the way in terms of the tokenization of everything that we were talking about a couple of years ago that uh, I believe is actually starting to impact the institutions. When you think about the tokenization of uh, real estate or other things, and we're going to get into that a little bit. Um, I want to introduce myself, Kel Canty, co-founder of a company called Verity. We make the legible crypto platform. Been in the space since about 2013 in various roles. Uh, founding member of the Regulatory Affairs Committee of the Bitcoin Foundation, back when Bitcoin was the only crypto. So seeing quite a bit, but I'm glad to be here with the panel with some uh, awesome experts in this area and looking forward to have a great panel around the institutional adoption of uh, some of the uh, new asset classes and the uh, new instruments that are becoming available in this great uh, age of innovation that we're having. Uh, so we'll go through uh, and uh, let's do the introductions. Uh, Richard, if you'd like to go. Oh, hi there, my name is Richard Johnson. I'm the founder and CEO of Text Capital. We're a FINRA member an SEC registered broker dealer specializing in digital asset securities. We help companies and investors more efficiently access private markets by providing tools for issuance, tokenization, and secondary market trading. Thanks, uh, thanks for moderating, Kel, and thanks to Ron for organizing this. Great. Um, now, uh, Pat W., we've got two Pats on the panel today, so I'm going with uh, Pat W. for uh, uh, Pat White of uh, Bitwave. Awesome. Hey, everyone. My name is Pat White of Bitwave. We're the you know, leading tax and accounting solution for businesses using digital assets and enterprises using digital assets. So I'm super excited to, to come here and talk. And I've been in the industry since about, oh God, when it, you could mine, back when you could mine Bitcoin on your computer, like the, the good old days. I just wish I'd mined so much more, $68,000 <laughs> a day. You guys believe that's crazy. So I'm Pat W. <laughs> all right. Thanks so much. Uh, and, and I agree with you. Um, all right. Uh, Pat Lavecchia. Uh, thanks, Kel. Hi, everybody. Uh, Pat Lebecchia, CEO of Oasis Pro Markets. Uh, we're also a FINRA broker dealer. We run a digital uh, securities ATS that'll be launching uh, in Q1. Um, we do private and public uh, to a certain extent, and uh, we can do digital cash for digital securities. We're registered for that as well. I got involved in the space about four years ago, four and a half years ago. I was a, a skeptic. Um, and, uh, then I got one over and, uh, I opened an account with Coinbase in 2014. And the only reason I know that is in 2018, I went to open an account with Coinbase and found out I already had, but it didn't buy any Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that's great. And, uh, nothing's better than the, you know, I, I find actually in my conversations that the people who were at first skeptics, once they fully understand all the, uh, all the details and uh, the possibilities and, and potentials of, of digital assets and, and cryptocurrencies. Uh, typically, they're, they're some of the, the best people in the field. So uh, glad to see that. Um, so for some of those uh, that have been around for panel one, uh, there's a, a lot of talk specifically around you know, crypto and tokens, um, you know, particularly with uh, Gary Gensler's uh, kind of new sheriff in town approach to this. Um, I thought it'd be interesting from the institutional side to kind of think about and, and talk briefly around, you know, more of the digital assets and tokenization that two of our panelists kind of concentrate in, in terms of 
you know, the clarity there, the things that you guys are seeing in the industry, as opposed to, you know, more of the Wild West with obviously, you know, Gary has kind of a, an approach and, and there seems to be a concentration from the SEC, uh, particularly around some of the things we're going to talk in a little bit around uh, DeFi and uh, particularly lending that he's mentioned on several occasions during certain uh, speeches of that. But, uh, you know, in terms of uh, back in 2017, 18, uh, we were talking about the tokenization of things, and we've seen that with some limited uh, things going forward. Want to want to get an understanding and kind of a reading and uh, your expert opinion and thoughts and questions and, and just comments on, you know, what what about digital tokenization and digital assets as far as institutional adoption, and what what do you think that that's looking like? And uh, I'll start that off with you, Richard. Thank you, Kel. Uh, well, digital assets is such a broad term, right? Um, you know, obviously starting from Bitcoin, going all, you know over to you know utility tokens, uh, stable coins, security tokens, etc. Um, so, I, you know, I think we're seeing broadly, um, you know, tremendous adoption of um, you know digital assets. Let's start with kind of Bitcoin and um, you know and, and the core crypto. I think there was, you know there's been a turning point over the last few years, like coming out of, um, you know, the last crypto winter, um, you know, it, it was down, whatever it was, 70% or something from its high. And, you know, you know, a lot of people wondered if we were ever going to get back out of it. Um, but when we did start coming out of that, what I think you saw is some real, some really credible names getting into the space. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of like Paul Tudor Jones, um, Stanley Druckenmiller. And I think when these guys who are like, you know, old school titans of Wall Street. When they say it's okay to get in, I think that was kind of a green light for a lot of other people. Then of course you had MicroStrategy coming after that, putting it into their treasury. Um, so, you know, you know, and then, you know, another, another thing to look at is Grayscale, look at the assets and the management they have, which is a very institutional vehicle. So, you know, individuals can easily buy, you know, open account, Coinbase account now and buy a whole bunch of different coins, but institutions can't, you know, they can't very much put that in their portfolio as easily. So GBTC or ETHE or whatever is, is the vehicle to do that. Um, I actually used to work prior to Texture Capital, I was a uh, kind of a crypto market structure analyst at Greenwich Associates. And we did a few surveys on uh, uh, crypto adoption. We actually ran the Fidelity survey for a couple of years. Well, I did, I did it for a couple of years, they're still doing it. Um, and what we've seen from that and what I think is kind of, you know, still showing through in, in, the, in the data, is that there's a tremendous interest in it from institutional investors uh, in all different types of uh, you know of crypto, including uh, you know tokenized stocks, tokenized real estate, and stable coins. Um, I do think that certainly that the tokenization of securities and, and other assets has moved more slowly, um, and I can certainly you know, speak to that being you know being, you're running a digital securities broker dealer. You know, a lot of the reason for that is because I feel, you know, the regulation has been very, you know, has been much slower. It took firms like Texture and Oasis Pro an awfully long time, far too long dealing with FINRA to get to get our licenses for uh, to go live. And that kind of, I think that kind of put a bit of a, um, you know, a dampener on the enthusiasm, you know, as it were. I think when, you, when the ICOs first blew up in 2018, I was like, okay, let's just make them security tokens. But then it wasn't that simple because there, were, there weren't any brokers to do it. That's why I started Texture is to, is to, is to kind of facilitate that type of thing. Um, but we're getting, but I think, I think we're really starting to see a steep upward curve now on that side of things. And uh, just finally, um, you know, the other thing that's been a very interesting and unexpected catalyst this year is NFTs. Um, I think that's blown up. Um, and I, you know, it, you know, in ways I don't think we could have imagined, uh, frankly. Um, and what that has done is that's brought people who aren't in finance or technology into the space because you know NFTs are for creators, they're for artists, musicians, athletes. You're seeing, you know, you know Kevin Durant, you know, you know, you know uh, Tom Brady, all these types of characters, or, or, you know, um, who are not finance people getting into it. And I think that's made people realize. You know, there's you know a hell of a lot more to this technology and kind of feeding that tokenization of everything uh, that you, that you started talking about. Okay, um, Pat, do you do you agree, Pat Levecchia? Great. Um, yeah, I, uh, I I do agree. I'll, I'll tell you, you know, I'll, I'll go down a different path than uh, what Richard just shared mm -hmm. um, as well. Um, 
in regards to um, to the base uh, for institutions to get involved, it's about trust at the end of the day. And we're moving in that direction. Uh, we're not there yet, but the large players, especially for Bitcoin and ETH, <clears throat> have built infrastructures on the custodial side. So at the end of the day, institutions, you know, uh, one of the reasons I didn't invest in Bitcoin in 2014 is um, what was behind it, right? I had no idea. And, uh, and uh, now uh, the big players, uh, Fidelity's, State Street, uh, Bank of New York, et cetera, are all in this space. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's going to give more and more comfort as they delve deeper. They are not yet in uh, the digital security space, but the infrastructure is being built. So that, that'll be in place because, you know, if they're working with ERC-20 tokens or some of the other ERC tokens, they can easily move to the smart contracts for uh, digital securities. But uh, a bit of big news that came out yesterday, which I think is additive to this in regards to a major milestone event for the digital asset industry or digital securities, and I, I, my group was a part of this as well. I, I sit on the executive advisory board for private securities for DTCC. And we've been working for a little less than a year with the team, the senior management of DTCC uh, regarding uh, private securities and where they wanted to head. So yesterday they announced that um, Q1, Q2 of 2022, DTCC will be able to offer faster settlement times for private securities, T plus one, reduced operational costs, automated transfer restriction approval, and most importantly, establish a good control location. Now, you can't get much better than DTCC. And the fact that they're utilizing the blockchain for everything I just shared, and the announcement came out yesterday, and you know, I'm sure in uh, Ron's newsletter, again, Ron, thank you for uh, inviting me to this as well. Um, it, you know, uh, the attachments should be should be there. So, you know, that's just terrific news. And, uh, you know, many on this call probably saw it. But, uh, uh, you know, when I got involved on the executive advisory board, you know, I was very upfront with uh, uh, colleagues internally and at the DTCC and those others that participated that this I didn't expect this to take less than a year. And it did. And uh, it's just phenomenal result for this industry. A couple of other just comments, you know, I'll share is that my advice to people uh, who wanted to get in the space a year ago was buy Bitcoin, buy ETH. I'm, I'm a big believer in ETH, so you know I've been buying more ETH than Bitcoin, but but uh, you know you can't go wrong with both if you have a long term strategy. And what's a long term strategy? A decade. I've now moved, and 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 part of this is my comfort with the underlying trust within this industry and what's being offered to suggesting other layer one protocols uh, like a Solana, uh, potentially a Cardano, certainly an Avalanche, et cetera, and some layer twos and some other tokens. And th this is to individuals who know nothing about crypto. So I'm, I'm not as zealot, but you know, from a, uh, from a, a, um, diversification standpoint, I think we're at that point, which, you know, is a, is a positive. And uh, I completely concur with, uh, with uh, Richard's comments regarding NFTs. Uh, <clears throat> NFTs are really opening up the world in, into a different sector about what the opportunities are and the creative types <clears throat> in the finance world are starting to think about fractionalization of NFTs with real world assets. And, and we are as well. So uh, yeah, it's, it's exciting times, but, but it's going to take time. You know, I, you know, I don't want to be, a, a, you know, dour on this it, on the digital security side, you know, we're in it. We think it's going to be at least five years. Uh, it could be as soon as three for a tipping point, but it's going to take time. And uh, it's kind of fun being at the forefront of it. And that, that's, that's great. And uh, you know, it's interesting to hear you guys talk about, uh you know, about the NFTs. And I think it's a kind of a good segue uh, for, for Pat W in terms of, you know, uh, I, I believe, you know, there's a lot of work that uh, you do over there at BitWave with uh, NFTs. And it's interesting to think, you know, we've, I've been in the space a while and the original NFTs on, on Ethereum were, you know, positive for uh, tracking, you know, KYC to institutional investors and 
maybe identifying a financial instrument. And then all of a sudden we got crypto kitties, right? Um, and then they kind of went away for a little while and now they're back again as creatives and, and the things like that. And, you know, uh, from a personal standpoint, I keep thinking that, you know, they've got to make that bridge. And if you're uniquely identifying a piece of art or song or something like that, then there's not that much bridge if you look at something like a, a, a property in terms of identifying or fractionalizing a property or, you know, identifying a, um, an institutional investor, KYC, the financial instrument, a bond, something like that. But um, Pat W., uh, with the work that you're doing with uh, corporates and things of that nature, are, are you seeing a, a similar adoption in terms of the NFTs um, or just the digital asset, uh, maybe even for treasury use uh, in general? Well, I said it, what's happening is that the distinct. So, what I like talking about crypto, the thing I love about crypto is that every summer it's like the summer of XYZ. And it's, it's always different and it's always crazy and it's always nuts. So, like, we go into pandemic, 2020 was a summer of DeFi. We, you know, we come out of pandemic, uh, 2021 was a summer of NFTs. You know, the, the base concepts here haven't really changed. Like, NFTs have been around for a long time. NFTs as a tokenization instrument actually don't really, we, we actually don't see that for real, for, for real, uh, real asset tokenization. We see, we see fungible tokens. So one of our customers is Realty. They do, they do uh, uh, tokenization of, of houses. Like basically they buy houses and people, uh, you know, pay their rent to them. They rent them out, people pay their rent and then you buy tokens that they can own ownership in that house. And then they flow through, you know, um, revenue to you as the token owner. So you don't need to have a fund. You don't have to have an NFT for that piece of it. Uh, all of the, a lot of the tokenization pieces. And I think that goes for what uh, Pat L was saying, which is, you know, if you're looking at tokenizing art or anything like that, you're really not going to lean towards NFTs. It just, what happens in this space is like, we get the, we get terms on our, on our mouth. Like the, the, it's like the thing that we're all talking about is NFTs. Now we are seeing some really cool where, where I like, I like art NFTs. I don't love them. Like I own a couple. I don't like, they're not my favorite thing in the entire world. It's super interesting. Like they're super interesting to think about. I think a lot of people tend to discount art NFTs. You know, if you don't spend a lot of time in the crypto communities, you tend uh, you tend to sort of say NFTs are dumb. Like it's you know right click, right click, copy the copy the JPEG, move on. You like there tends to be this kind of like bias against art. Um, and and we talk about this a lot. Like I've I've been on a couple of panels talking about why why NFTs are a thing. And, and I'll spend just like one second talking about why institutions should care about NFTs. Because even if you kind of look at the space, you say, look at like, gosh, you know, uh, 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 you know, blockchain ownership of a JPEG, like this just seems so insane, tulipy. Um, what, I will, what I will kind of say on this is that there's a couple of ways to look at this. The first way is that there is people, people the way that people are engaging their digital identity is is really drastically changed over the last year has changed over the last year so the conference the, the the panel i was speaking on recently was about the metaverse and it was me and a couple of people who work at 3d graphics companies and they're still talking about the metaverse as this thing where you put on a vr headset and you like you, you know you click out and your snow crash and ready player one whatever it is um, and i love that vision but like that actually we we all went to sleep and we woke up in the metaverse over the last couple of years like at some point we started dating over Zoom. We started hiring employees completely remotely. We started spending our entire lives in front of, of screens and our digital identity started going from this sort of like nascent, like, oh, I have a Twitter profile to like, this is who I am because this is where people see me. So NFTs are the sort of natural extension of like your digital identity. And, and that's really important for institutions to think about because that's very relevant. Like this isn't, I, you know, I could be wrong, but I don't think this is going away. Like art NFTs, like I don't think they're, it's going away. Like we deal with, we have customers who are investing in them, who have large portfolios. We have, we have large companies that are treasuring them. And we work with a lot of companies that are now starting to do brand work with NFTs. So my, my, my take for this, this particular panel is, is that it is, it's, it, it might not be something that you understand or that you particularly like, but the same way, that's the same way that like not everyone likes baseball cards and everyone likes collecting, you know, art or photo. Like it is a niche thing for people that tend to be a little bit more digital native to kind of express themselves in digital identity. And it's not going away. And it's, it's definitely a place for you to spend time thinking about. So a little bit of a twist on the question, Kel, but I like, I like, I like talking about NFTs. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's good. I just, you know, I, I, I'm curious from your standpoint, I'd love to hear uh, Richard and, and Pat Ells uh, as well as that, you know, can, can NFTs make that jump beyond, uh, you know, a, 
a piece of digital creatorship, whatever it is, and go into that, you know, you, you said the word digital identity, and that to me, from a, a standpoint of an institution in terms of identifying a financial instrument or identifying a particular, you know, tranche or, or something of that nature, or a, uh, you know, accredited, uh, you know, a high net worth individual or other institutional counterparty, um, I'm not sure if that's, if the existing mechanisms for that are going to stay the same, or if there's even an option given the slowness of just getting the assets in, if if that further capability that you're talking about with NFTs are going to be adopted into institutions, and I guess you know it might depend on the level of institution a little bit. What do you what do you think about that? Well, uh, you know, in regards to you know, I, I'll, I'll take it down the uh, the route of the universal IDs and the NFTs. There, you know, there are a whole host of companies uh, attempting to to take that market and. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you know, at the end of the day, um, is that a for-profit institution or is it, is it, you know, done through, um, through some quasi-governmental resource? I, you know, I'm not sure, uh, but you know, there are a number of companies um, coming to us and asking us to utilize their uh, universal IDs, some of which are NFTs or, you know, along those lines. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll address it that way. We just don't know. Um, we're, we're going down the old, uh, compliance and regulatory process yep. of, you know, whitelisting everybody the old fashioned way and yep. it's automated, but still going down that path yep. and, uh, working with trusted partners along those lines. So e even something like, um, and I haven't heard anything about this recently. Maybe you guys have of the, the Microsoft identity, uh, uh mechanism that was based on Bitcoin. That was, that was a hot thing a couple of years ago. And I haven't. I haven't really heard anything about it lately in terms of, you know, using blockchain attributes uh, like an NFT kind of uh, to identify, you know, particular individuals for, for purposes of, of onboarding, right? I'm not sure what happened to that. Yeah, I don't know what happened to that. You know, you hear rumors about Microsoft, like you hear interesting rumors about Microsoft and crypto and you know they're doing something. I mean, honestly, like you look at Xbox and talk about, I mean, outside of identity, what you have as a captive audience with that is, that expresses their digital, you know, self through the badges that they're owning. Oh my God. Like there's just so much, there's so much ways that, that Microsoft will be taking advantage of this going forward. The digital identity space is super, it's super interesting because I'm not sure we've still figured out, like, I'm not sure we've still totally gotten away from the act, the fact that like, regardless of what cryptographic instrument you present, you still got to scan your face. You still got to like sign, like there's all these things that still have to happen around that because you can't really trust just a cryptographic instrument because anyone can get those private keys, right? Yeah. But you know, the other area, ju just to uh, quickly touch upon this, uh, because there is a component to digital assets and potentially digital securities as well, is um, like the games out of Asia, like Axie and Aurori that have come out and they have NFTs for gameplay, but you need to, you need to buy all your, uh, your equipment and then it's very engaging. Uh, the, this gamification with NFTs, we think, is going to be, uh, it, it's already exploding. I, I, you know, if, if you look at token prices, I believe actually at one point was $0.08, cents and now it's $150 right. in a year's time, maybe a year and a half. And uh, there's another project that just came out called Aurori. But, but there will be an opportunity to, NF, you know, to, to utilize that. NFTs in a way to sell um, equipment, right? In fact, I think that's already happened. And, you know, it may take you a thousand levels to the Microsoft example mm -hmm. to get, you know, some, you know, some, some exciting uh, sword or whatever it may be in these games. Um, as you can tell, I don't play a lot of this, but I do buy the tokens. The, uh, yeah, but it's going to be very interesting. And then what we've already been talking to some folks in this gamification er uh, area about, about bundling some of these and then fractionalizing them and selling them as securities, uh, potentially. I think it's a long way off. It's probably not in the next six months, but it, you know, it may be. Uh, it, it's, it's exploding. It really is. Yeah. Uh, then actually, um, I had a quick question that I'd forgotten about. Um, but Pat W, for the example that you mentioned in terms of the real estate and supplying a, a stream, uh, income stream based on that tokenization or that NFTizing of that real estate property, I mean, what what are the regulatory um, concerns around that from a, a standpoint of a, if an institution wanted to get into that stream? Is that 
judge the security and what things are around there? Or is that kind of like, um, anyway, what, what are your thoughts on that? And what have you seen? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. I mean, there's I, the, the, essentially the regulatory posture on this is that most of these things still sit at security. So if you are disallowed to, to be into securities for whatever reason as an institution, um, then you will still be barred from a lot of those, those aspects. I mean, I think the panel before this hit, like they said something very like correct, which is essentially that the, like the place where we see the least amount of clarity, like, you know, people talk about, about crypto taxes, not being clear, like crypto taxes are clear. Like this is like, you can, there are people who don't like crypto taxes and they don't like the government stance on it, but that's different than, than lack of regulatory clarity. The biggest still regulatory clarity that's out there still is around is around securities, whether these tokens are securities or not. And we like I I like I shuddered uh, when the question in the last panel where they said they asked whether there should be another body uh, handling crypto is that the worst like the it's terrifying to think about this stuff because the the regulatory bodies tend to very amorphously consume regulatory jurisdiction. And so one more body just means more sort of amorphous regulatory jurisdiction. No one is putting like hard stakes in the ground at this point. And I don't, even if the, another body came out, it would just be one more blob trying to eat the rest of the world. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be these really, really clearly delineated lines. So yeah, I know it's still, it's still very up in the air. You know, a lot of these companies have, you know, are doing multiple organizations or they have Cayman entities. I don't, I don't think they do, but you know, there's, there are a lot of different ways you deal with this. And a lot of it comes down to, not being part of the U.S., like not allowing U.S. people to take advantage of this. And that that's the stuff that just gets me going. Like every single day drives me insane is when you look at what happened with Coinbase, you know, regardless of what you think about Coinbase, they tried to open up a 4% interest, you know, bearing account that anyone could use and the SEC smacked them down. The uh, I guess it was SEC right now. I'm like, I'm blanking what, what regulatory agency on it was. Well, it was SEC because it was interesting. The CFTC kind of the yeah. seller. Uh, over that, and they actually find them right before their IPO that they had to clear that up. Uh, but now the SEC is saying like we're going to take over that. But uh, the the potential so huge, though. I, I think you know I, I wanted to bring up something uh, that in a, a previous discussion that uh, Richard brought up is you know kind of evidenced by the fact that the institutions uh, believe in this and where it's going, and the fact that even though it might be a, a longer time frame, you know, as um, Pat Elb mentioned. Uh, but uh, talk a little bit about what you're seeing and, and what your thoughts are about like the the m a activity and kind of some of the consolidation and some of the, you know, I guess we just heard that update on the DTCC getting into the game and, you know, by, you know, internal development probably with some help, but there's also a lot of people angling and, and bringing things together from uh, an M&A standpoint to start bringing crypto into the institutional infrastructure. Yeah, I mean, I think the big one that was kind of a, uh that came out was PayPal buying Curve. Um, they'd already started doing, you know, offering Bitcoin through through Paxos, and then you know, obviously decided to go go all in on that. Uh, yeah, I think that I think that's going to be the sign, or, or you know, another sign of institutional adoption is when the uh, you know the institutions, generally speaking, the larger banks and so forth, they are you know, not particularly innovative. They don't want to be innovative, frankly, and uh, they're quite happy to wait. And uh, wait a few years, see who see who the successful players are, and then you know they're, they're happy to overpay if they need to just to to, to get a get a space in there. So yeah, um, you know, there's been a couple of others that I don't spring to mind right now. Maybe the other panelists remember it, but I think we're going to be seeing more of that going forward for sure. Uh, I think the CBOE made a move. Yeah, that's the one. Aerosex is the one we were talking about before on the prep call. Yeah, that's that that's kind of a big move there, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and then, you know, uh, the one that I keep seeing just from a standpoint, and maybe it's because of all the partnerships and, and maybe it's because of just the amount of news and coverage because of all the partnerships, but uh, NIDIG and all of their activity is, is really uh, just, I mean, I think between all the relations that are, they're getting downstream to like 650 banks and institutions left, right and forward. Uh, um, in terms of, you know, maybe the clearest ones, you see BNY is, is looking to do some things. You, You've seen some other partnerships from the from the kind of the banking and institution standpoint for the the crypto assets. Maybe not necessarily the the digitized uh, securities that you guys work with. Where do you think the the leadership or who are the biggest players and the earliest adopters that are kind of like helping pave the way for this? What's your opinion on that, just from a, an industry standpoint? Um, 
Well, I'd, I'd, I'd like to answer uh, uh, the earlier question as well. I, sure. You know, I, I, I can't name anybody. Um, you know, perhaps Richard and Patrick or yourself, Kel, can in regards to who, who the leaders are uh, and at the real at the forefront. Goldman Sachs just announced a uh, a um, partnership with Digital Asset, which is uh, basically cradle to grave smart token open source for digital asset infrastructure that was announced yesterday or the day before. So, uh, but but at the end of the day, these are behemoths and they don't mind overpaying and uh, they're not gonna move anytime soon until the institutions demand it um, at the end of the day. So I, uh, I'm at a loss to, mention, to actually throw out a name on that front. Back to the M&A front, uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, certainly, you know, CBOE, ErisX, prior to that Ledger X, which is in the crypto space uh, uh, being acquired by FTX. Uh, frankly, in the space texture and I are in, I, I am, there's a group I'm very, very, very familiar with that uh, has gotten three takeover offers in the last month and a half wow. uh, or two months. Um, so uh, I can't say anything else about that, but this whole space is moving to regulatory, the regulatory space. And, you know, crypto was built on non-regulatory, but I think it's become quite evident that uh, some of these very large DEXs and others out there are starting to see that the, you know, they have to work with the regulators. And, and frankly, my background and, and Richard's and the other panelists here is Wall Street, legal, compliance, regulatory. So we all knew at the end of the day, at some point that would, uh, that would raise its head. And uh, I think we're there. So do you think that we're gonna end up with kind of a bifurcation in terms of, you know, the the ones that are, are trying to um, comply to the best of the kind of hazy regulations put forth. Um, people, you know, great players in the space like Ave that are, you know, launching institutional um, capabilities. And then, you know, the, the others say like the pancake swap type activities where, you know, maybe the tokens are not as recognized and more um, um, spam, let's call tokens um, and things of that nature. Uh, is, is that going to be more of the, how are you seeing the future of DeFi in terms of ones that will get adopted and approved and institutionalized and available to provide that, you know, either like liquidity pool provisioning, you know, lending, uh, all that kind of yield farming type activity that's becoming, we see that in some hedge funds that we work with and things like that. And I know it's, it's starting to move up the chain, um, but it, it seems like to me that uh, the cowboys are going to be moving over here. And the big boys are coming here and the ones that are recognized that like an Ave, I think are gonna be kind of the benefactors or the beneficiaries, I'm sorry. Well, any thoughts on that? I think, I think the Cowboys are moving really fast. All, all the, you know, the Uniswaps and, and pancake swaps, whatever. That's gonna be the big challenge for regulators to figure out is DEXs. And um, you know, how do they handle that? How do they, you know, enforce regulation on 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 dexes which are you know decentralized there is no uh, there's no you know it's a smart contract there's you know it, you know to, to, to break it down a little bit simply here there's no one to sue there's no one to arrest um what they did with uh ether delta which one of the first dexes is they did i think i can't remember the details but i think the servers were in the us and they were maintained by this guy and they managed to they, they arrested him and, um, and that was a lesson for all the future de DEXs and how to set up their DEXs to keep them out of you know, regulatory oversight. Um, that's, you know, you're gonna have, you're gonna have yield farming and you're gonna have, um, you, you know, hedge funds investing in that, potentially even, you know, companies putting out, you know, unregistered securities that are, you know, yield funds of some sort. So they're like kind of quasi in, in the kind of regulated world. But ultimately, I. I you know, I think I, I don't see how um, um, you know the, the regulators get comfortable with DEXs without making them centralized because they, they they like that centralization. They like you know you know people you know got to have a counterparty. You have a you have a transfer agent. You have a custodian. All these different roles. Regulators like that. They don't like this decentralized world. It's very hard for them to figure out. So I don't know which way it's going to go. I think you're probably going to have. Um, you know the, de the dexes and the AMMs carry on um, in, in the in the wild west for a while. Um, I think the most pressing challenge is stablecoins and what do they do with stablecoins? 
Um, you know, they're they have tremendous utility um, just with a lowercase u anyway. They're extremely useful uh, um, in, in, in traditional finance and in crypto. Um, you know, you've got your know, Paxos, um, is, is, you know, they're at OCC's banking circles as well at this point uh, behind them. So that they, you know, there's banking licenses behind them, but there's also all question marks about you know, the, the, the KYC, the provenance of KYC as they get moved from place to place. Traditional banks um, are not going to get on board you know, with, a, with, a, with a regular stable coin on a public network. They're all still talking about private networks for that and, and uh, you know, private, private ledgers, basically, which I think as we, you know, most of us on this panel, probably in the audience realize it's kind of like the, you know, internet versus internet argument or you know, the, the well, remember private, the, uh, private ledgers have failed at this point. I mean, IBM, IBM spent a hundred million dollars trying to make Hyperledger a thing. And if I could just, if I had my meme, which is like, stop trying to make Hyperledger a thing. I mean, they spent a lot of money on on building out a whole team to do private ledgers and the thing is that that's not it's not interesting like it's not the, no. the value from this stuff especially like smart contracts comes from when you are actually doing stuff on it like it comes from a, a smart contract that you poke when a container crosses a, a border uh, through customs and then that releases funds that's real money it's not like the the that's where you're having like all these different groups from like the customs agents and the and the different shippers and the u.s agencies all involved in one place that doesn't happen in private blockchains that happens on private servers if you want to do it but like the public blockchain like private blockchains essentially uh lost i, don't, don't I think, I think the that analogy happens. that I, that you yeah, there's the internet internet arguments uh remember there were, you know most people a lot of people younger than us don't remember what an internet was but it was something that <laughs> you know large institutions set up as a kind of a private internet maybe may, i think you know Private cloud is something a lot more recent. Maybe ten years ago, there's a thing called private cloud. Um, it was a disaster, of course. Well, the whole point of cloud is that it's it, it's public and accessible. Well, not public, but it's accessible, and you know, you know, you know, anyone can kind of you know, kind of rent time, rent compute time. It's managed externally, etc. So I think that's kind of the analogy we have here with stable coins. And just one more point before I before I shut up here on this one is uh, USDC. Which is perhaps like the regular, uh, sorry, CBDC, um, uh, which is perhaps the regulated answer to stable coins. I think is, you know, I, 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 I don't I think it's a terrible idea. I don't think people are going to want to have the government looking at their wallet and looking at every single transaction they have. So I think it's going to ultimately going to come back to figuring out how we can get stable coins acceptable, more acceptable. Well, I mean, but by another reading of all this, stable coins are patently illegal in the U.S. I mean, the U.S. is very, very clear that their stance that there's only one U.S. currency. There's only one. Like they, they arrest people in different places that try to introduce different currencies and stable coins. There's a very real argument that stable coins are 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 like illegal in the U.S. in some ways. So, I mean, that's a place like hopefully because I think that the the regulatory group in the U.S. said the Biden's working group said that he was going to take they were going to take stable coins on first. That's a place that I hope we get really, really good clarity on because that is a very, very critical part of the whole e e ecosystem at this point. Yeah, you know, and we're one. just asking for clarity, you yeah. know, regardless of if they're deemed mutual funds, uh, which are uh, money market funds, as many people think. Right. And, uh, you know, it's just a question of who, who will regulate the uh, stable coins at the That's end of the day. From our looking... perspective, you know, we just want clarity from the regulators. That's well, probably not coming out anytime soon. You know, just because of con you know where Congress is right now, and where the country is at this point in terms of, uh, um, you know, the uh, the uh, the two parties. But I do think that you know, at the end of the day, to the earlier question about innovations happening every day, mm -hmm. I do think that it's very hard for the regulators to keep up with it in regards to the earlier question. Um, However, projects that are starting today, I think the regulators will move fairly quickly to shut down if there is a concern. Projects that have been in place for the last five to seven years, it'll be almost impossible to the, to the earlier point Richard mentioned, who do you sue? Who do you take to court? Now there are these DAOs and, and DeFi is all about removing the middleman at the end of the day. So, so I think going forward, the regulators will be on top of it. Uh, which, which again, from our perspective, I think everyone on, on all these panels today welcomes. Uh, I, by the way, I just I I both don't welcome. Well, I welcome more clarity, but I don't rec re I don't welcome regulators uh, applying laws inconsistently 
Yeah, and I and I certainly don't don't. Uh, I actually I actually like the, the Pats are going to have a little disagreement here, buddy, because I I actually disagree that there's going to be uh, uh, aggressive regulatory action. I mean, at the end of the day, the it's you're, what you're balancing is is how fast are the regulators responding with the speed of innovation. So the thing that has hit a absolute up and to the right exponential growth is the speed of innovation. Like the way I talk about crypto is people think about crypto as, as you know, you know, computers solving math problems to make to make money. Crypto is what happens when you give 100,000 or 200,000 of the best engineers in the world, you know, money and an API to use it. And what's happened consistently is we just out, we completely outkick ourselves every single day on what the next like level of innovation is. So, you know, Solana, I mean, you take like any of the biggest blockchains today, the top out of the top 10, five of the top 10 uh, coins by market cap today didn't exist a year ago. And there's, we're not getting any closer to, to regulating Solana or any of those. And all that's really happening is that we're, all that's really happening is that more people are being cognizant of setting up external entities and potentially moving out of the States. I mean, we have five different customers that up and just move their corporate headquarters out and move their people out of the States. And just, it's, you know, it's, it's um, uh, because this U.S. can essentially come in when you have this kind of lack of regulatory clarity. What the U.S. can do is they can come in and say, well, we're going to ruin your life, you know, Etherdex, because, you know, you deserve, you know, because you got caught. But Solana and Solar, the Solar Dex, like, ah, you guys are OK. It's just it's become this like really tenuous position of like it's like a speed limits, right? Like everyone's breaking the law at this point. So you're going to pick one person a day to kind of pull over. It's a really bad situation that the U.S. has found itself in, and we're 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 like losing more and more of these fights in a really bad way. That's that's what makes me unhappy about it. And well, you know, I I my heart agrees with you. My head doesn't. So uh, so all right, we'll bet we'll bet a beer on I it. Agree we'll see. on certain items, but look, the U.S. is resilient. You know, at the end of the day, uh, the U.S. is still the market everybody wants to be in. So hopefully, the regulators will uh, will move faster than you know than you anticipate and I anticipate. Well, one, one thing, so uh, Pat W, you and I have probably both, uh, you know, worked uh, with client companies that either have uh, offshore entities or have ended, we've had a couple of them actually move offshore, um, you know, that are either ICO or other kind of companies. And, and that's what we're seeing from an operational companies or have in the past, like basis. I think some of them are just starting offshore right now, um, yes. you know, just flat out from the get go, right. Instead of doing the U S and, Cayman or Singapore or whatever uh, type foundation things. Uh, from a and, standpoint, and a um, lot of that is just due to the regulatory. I mean, a lot of that is just oh, yeah. regulatory pressure because what you do is you you take your ICO tokens, which are the the ones that have the least amount of regulatory clarity, and you park those in the Cayman entity. And now you and then the the payment of the payment of tokens is a lot clearer from a regulatory standpoint, I and mean, you're paying individuals and stuff. But the existence of those tokens to begin with and the sale of them is not. So you just basically like you compartmentalize the, the thing. But then even then, like my first job out of college was for an online poker company that tried to do a lot of like stuff like that. And they had like license agreements and software and servers running in Malta. And like my job there ended when one of the, the CEO got arrested in the Apple plane in Jersey. I mean, it's like there's it's it's one of those things that is it's just not like lack of really clarity is very, very bad for individuals and not just like the industry that we are. Right. Uh, I, I think, you know, uh, it's interesting that we've seen that with the, the corporates and the token projects that have kind of launched that way. And, you know, from one standpoint, I, I, I kind of call it, um, you know, jurisdictional arbitrage. Now, if I think about institutions that are multinational in scope, uh, I'm curious, given, you know, what you guys have both said around five years, you know, a long time, you know, there's, there's a new sheriff in town with uh, Gary Gensler and possibly a new OCC head and things of that nature. Uh, what and yet at the same time we're seeing you know things like M and A activity and DTCC. Well, that's more of a blockchain technology. But um, what do you think about the evolution of institutional adoption in in terms of possibly having a, a component or a large component of uh, jurisdictional arbitrage in terms of well our, our our unit that deals with the digital assets or the digital securities or the crypto um, is actually not based in the U.S. But you know kind of kind of how the ICO structured it. So to get away from a, you know, a perhaps a unclear, hazy uh, environmental thing, uh, uh, regulatory wise. Any thoughts? W would that go or are they gonna keep trudging to get it cleared through the US? Well, but there's gonna be regulatory ar arbitrage. It's happening now. You know, it, it, it's if you, you know, DeFi projects are avoiding the US deliberately. Um, 
and um, you know it's 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 going to keep happening. I do think it's going to be a long time to get any kind of decent regulatory clarity, and um, I think we're just kind of in a way I think we're kind of stuck with it. But um, you know, as Pat was saying, the US is the biggest market, biggest capital markets in the world. So I think the you know the the regulators here can afford to be you know uh, uh, to take their time a little bit and, um, and 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 perhaps be a little stricter for now. Interesting. It's interesting in a DeFi world talking about about largest markets because the it's you start to get to a world where where the largest market doesn't really matter. I mean, we're sitting here arguing about what Goldman Sachs is going to put their money into, but Goldman Sachs has instruments they put their money into. And like overnight, I mean, DeFi as, as an asset class, you know, DeFi went from $0. I mean, maybe like, you know, there was, there was Maker. That was it. There was $50 million in Maker to now over $100 billion in like about a year, if not less. Uh, that is uh, essentially unheard of in modern parlance. And if we keep that, if we just, you know, do what we should do, which is just keep that going up. I mean, this is bigger than, you know, DeFi as a structural instrument is bigger than the U.S. financial services market. What I tend to talk about a lot, so stepping aside from like the, the philosophical discussion is that what institutions need to be worried about at a very, very deep level is that the U.S. has a multi-trillion dollar financial services industry that essentially makes their money on what is the, you know, the friction within the systems, whether that be ACH fees or, you know, poor late payment fees for people that can't handle it or, you know, for uh, they can't pay them um, or, uh, uh, you know, bond issuance. I mean, 3% to issue bonds. That's a 3%, that is essentially a friction fee that will be moving out of, that will be starting to evaporate out of the world. And so we spend all this time about like, oh, who's going to be first, who's going to be the leader, it, like, and, and like regulation, all that kind of stuff. Like, it's, it, to my mind, it's almost a moot point. Like, America, before anything else, is, is a capitalism. Like, it is, it, you know, it's democracy, it's this stuff, it's this stuff. It is capitalism. And if there's 3% to be saved on how you issue bonds, like, people are going to start doing that in the incredibly short term. Um, so I, I tend to look at that side of the market, which is like people are going to do the best effort to it. But at some point, a few companies will do it. The dam will break and the and and the money that just flows into it, the amount of money you can save. I mean, you're doing one hundred billion dollar bond issuance and you can save three billion dollars on that. Like that's that's a that's a title promotion for a CFO. So like the, the world is like is kind of changing in how we have to think about these problems. Um, well, we're running a little short on time. I'd like to go one by one real quick and then turn it over to Ron for questions. Uh, but uh, I, I think maybe I'll just, uh, you, you had said summer of NFT, but I, I have a question, you know, maybe relating to, you know, institutional. What, what do you think the, the next big step in moving DeFi and other crypto assets and digital assets um, forward in institutional adoption? What's going to be the next big news besides, you know, Pat L has already teased us with the thing he can't talk about. Uh, Richard? Huh. Just thinking broadly about um, crypto assets, you know, what I, you know, we have the Bitcoin ETF, which is, you know, somewhat flawed, as I think we all agree. But I, I don't think we're going to get, not for a while, I don't think we're going to get the spot ETF, which is, which is actually what I think we, we would need. Um, to have some real adoption going forward. So I don't know, I, I'm not gonna, you know, you know, maybe in Ethereum ETF, we'll see, we'll, see, we'll see people launching Ethereum futures to get the uh, get the Ethereum futures ETF coming out. All right, Ethereum ETF, that's your vote. All right, Pat L, besides the, the T's. You know, um, it's difficult. I, I think that uh, we, we speak to a number of broker dealers who are trying to figure out because clients are demanding it, how to get into this space. And, uh, you know, in terms of derivative swaps, in terms of just buying crypto, right? Uh, and it's coming from institutions and retail. So, you know, rather than a product, <clears throat> to my earlier comments, I think these big players coming in, I, I know Patrick W. May, may, uh, may disagree with me on this, but the big players coming in, bringing more trust to this ecosystem, adding to the trust already established is a, a big deal. I, I don't have a name uh, specifically, but I would say, um, you know, Bitcoin and uh, Bitcoin hitting a hundred thousand uh, mm -hmm. is going to be, uh, you know, another milestone in this, uh, in this area, uh, in this whole ecosystem. And if Bitcoin, 
And by the way, when it hits 100, it may go down to 50 or 20 again, just yeah. as quickly. But um, Bitcoin hitting a, a hundred thousand um, is is going to be a milestone, and I think everything else follows along. It's like a, you know, I if you track your tokens, except if there's some something something specific to a gaming NFT token or et cetera, they all tend to move in line with each other, um, for the most part. At least the big ones do. So. Um, not answering your, ca- uh, your no, question. No, no, no. I, I think I'm hearing the same thing from you and Richard, which is um, kind of a form of gradually, then suddenly, right? <laughs> which I'm a big believer in. So is it going to be Pat versus Pat? Pat W., your, your answer. No, you know, it's funny. So I think 2022, if, I'm, if we're putting pins in these things, so everyone loves a good prediction at the end of the year. Uh, my prediction at the, end of, at the end of 2021 or 2020 was 100K Bitcoin 2022. I got got a month and a half left. I don't know. We'll see how this goes. But if the market's right now, it will. Damn, yeah, like I, I think me and Sean might have a Sean with the WSBA SBA might have a bet on that. We'll see. Um, no, 2022 is going to be the the summer of uh, of uh, 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 essentially enterprise DeFi. So KYC AML DeFi. Now, what I think was going to happen though is is I'm not sure it will be the I'm not sure it will necessarily be the game changer we all are kind of thinking it will be. Because like there will be these KYC AML pools, and then people will be like, "Well, yo, oh, I have to, you know, for Abe Pro, we talked about that. Oh, I have to go through Fireblocks. Eh. Like, oh, I have to go through like this. Yeah, essentially, it was like, you know what? Yeah, our auditor is like, eh, okay, enough with us going into regular DeFi. We're just gonna do that. So, so I think that like summer 2022 is gonna be the summer of enterprise DeFi. It's gonna make a huge splash. But it, you know, essentially, uh, corporate and enterprise and institutional engagement with DeFi is is essentially an inevitability at this point. And like, there's so much money to be made on it that the people who are left behind are, uh, they're just going to be the losers of this next like kind of wave. So, I mean, if you can go put, put your money somewhere for 10% APY, like can't do that. There's not a lot of places to do that. And you can do that in DeFi right now. So that's my take. Yeah, we just take. lower, we need lower gas fees. That's the only thing. Lower gas fees for all. <laughs> uh, God bless you. That's why I saw you switch chains, I guess. Um. All right, sounds great. Uh, I wish uh, the audience was old enough to remember Blockbuster versus Netflix because I used to use that analogy, but a lot of people don't get it anymore. But great comments. Thank you, Rich and Pat and Pat. Um, Ron, are you there? I uh, wanted to see if you wanted to go through any of the questions. I am here, Kel. Kel and, and Richard and Patrick and Pat, thank you so much for the great questions. We've got a great commentary. We've got a lot of questions in. We also got some questions separately. I want to start with uh, Jan had submitted a question. It's a little bit more accounting focused, but I think it's relevant. What does the industry stand with regards to confirmation and attestation of NFT tokens related essentially to the scope of services that a, I think a CPA would offer for things like validation uh, or audit? Um, anyone want to weigh in on that? I, I think it's going to happen. I think, I think it's, I think it's, it's like essentially inevitable that there will be because it's, it's one of the big one of the big issues in the world is under collateralized lending on the blockchain. So so attestation attest whether it be CPA attest for businesses or for individuals is is essentially inevitable. It'll be interesting to see how it all shakes out in the long term. But I like uh, Jan, it's a great question and it is it is an inevitability. I have used that word a lot today, but. <laughs> Great, thank you. Kel or, or anyone else any, want to follow on with that? Or uh, I'll mention, we, we do some uh, audit verification for uh, in conjunction with a lot of uh, CPA firms with our tool, including stable coins. And so I, I think uh, at some point, you know, obviously the doing digital signature verification on the chains that supported, again, it's a very facts and circumstances. There's certain uh, NFTs that, uh, you know, are on closed blockchains that um, really are more centralized. And so uh, it, at, it's inevitable, just like Pat W said, um, and tools are available for some chains, but uh, you've got to have some expertise at the CPA firm and uh, that's growing day by day. And um, it's part and parcel like that W said. Great, thank you both. We got a question also uh, anonymously in the Q&A channel, which is always interesting. And it's, it's a bit in depth, let me read it. Uh, if DeFi eliminates friction fees, and I think Pat, Patrick, you were mentioning those, what will drive the economic incentive mechanism inside DeFi? after current liquidity incentives dry up, or will DeFi just be another iteration of essentially renter capitalism? Uh, does decentralization and staking present opportunities to make it much more than that? Uh, and I know Patrick, you and I've had this conversation, so I'd love you to kick off, but uh, I'd love feedback from all of you. Oh, I love it. It's a, it's a great question. I mean, it's essentially this, 
you know, it's the question is like, what happens if you really snap your fingers and evaporate all the financial services industries? Like what, what really happens at that point? Like what it, it's, I think that like, I, I try to get to that a little bit and saying that like, look, there's this friction that's applied by the Goldman's and JP Morgan's of the world. That is that they have kind of, they've, they've done the rent seeking to have regulatory control over a big swaths of the market. And this is not me going on some like insane, like, I mean, you know, rampage, like this is an enormous market in the U.S., that is that is controlled by a relatively small amount of people that have have categorically been deemed too big to fail. So like if that's not rent seeking, I don't entirely know what it is. Um, I don't actually think I, I think that the the um, the imminence of the demise of the kind of liquidity providing benefits and things like that is actually not going away. You know, when I think about what Goldman looks like five years from now, I actually imagine a company that owns uh, $20 billion of Uniswap uh, Uniswap DEX tokens that they're based on their governance token. Because if you own, if you are Goldman, you would love to own the DEXs of the future. I mean, it's like buying NASDAQ 20 years ago. So I actually think what's going to happen is I think we're going to continue to see the, the growth of these kind of governance tokens. It will just become more and more important. And it ends up being like a different way to do governance over open, open, open markets. But ultimately, that's incredibly good. I mean, having the, an open market for the governance of NASDAQ, like imagine we actually really have that. Instead of having to have regulators, we had everyone who had a stake in NASDAQ had an equal vote in what we were kind of doing with, with our different like exchanges. Um, that's incredibly powerful. And like you can, you know, then you balance the needs of the, the, the needs of the decks with the actual fees you're charging with the needs of the users with the, with the use. It's, you know, it's essentially, it's, it is gonna drive to zero. A lot of this stuff will drive to zero, but there still is, you know, when I provide liquidity, I want people to, like, I want to get a little bit of a fee on it. So you're never going to go to totally zero on the fees, but you're certainly going to start, you're certainly going to beat what the, what the uh, custodian, what the exchanges are getting out of it. So short answer. Patrick, thank you. Richard or, or Pat, anything you want to add to that? So that's, a that, that's, a big, that's a very good question, actually. I think Pat's answer is very good uh, talking about governance. I've got a completely different answer. Um, so the question about rent seeking, DeFi and so forth. So let's think about an intermediary in traditional finance now that you could almost think of as a, a classic rent seeker is something like the DTCC, where they're an intermediary that established specifically to facilitate settlement and collect rent for doing that. And how does DTC work? Well, they're made up of members, members of all the financial institutions who, uh, you know, who, who are involved in, you know, via their their customers in, in trading and settling security. So they have, they, they have a stake in how they want things to work out. And they're happy to pay, you know, to pay rent to the DCCC to do this. Now, you notice I used the word stake there. If we move like security tokens to a proof of stake network, it's kind of a perfect analogy in a DeFi way for how the DTCC works. So I could see you moving away from the DTCC model you listen, this will take a long time, but uh, you know, theoretically, you can move away from the DTCC model and have uh, cons you know, consensus-based proof-of-stake settlement for securities transactions. So you've kind of decentralized the DTCC, but the parties who, who, who are, are, you know, want to ensure the validity of these change, of, the, of these transactions are receiving the fees from, from staking and, and verifying transactions and so forth on, on the blockchain and security space. So that's, that's, that's a great answer as well. That's actually, I, I had even, I had never used that analogy of DCC, but it's such a good one. And it's so imagine because you take DCC and then you basically say like, well, let's make them a DAO and let's have all the members actually make votes on the proposals and how they spend their money. Because really they're a public interest. They're a, they're a public utility in many, many different ways. Like, shouldn't we all have a say in what they're spending their money on, especially in the financial, the institutional side. So I love that. That's, I'm going to, I'm going to steal the hell out of that. That was such a good, that was such <laughs> a good answer. Great. Well, thank you all. Uh, one last question, and we got this separately. And I, Richard, I think it might have been you. You had mentioned a couple of things, and many in the audience already know what they are, but I was wondering if we can clarify uh, for the sake of some of the audience. We mentioned yield farming and we mentioned AMMs. Do you have a 20 second that we can put out there for some of the colleagues who had, had watched the, the presentation? Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> 20 pager. <laughs> AMMs is a completely different way of, of market making. It stands for automated market making. In, in traditional equities, it's electronic market making. You're placing bids and offers at what you'll buy at. In, in these pools, they're paired pools and you're withdraw the, the, the adding and removing liquidity from those pools affects what the price will, will be essentially. And then di different pools are offering you kind of staking yield for kind of validating the, you know, you, for, for participating in these transactions. Maybe someone can do a better job th than me on that last part there. 
Uh, I think I, I think just for simplicity purposes, it's a peer to peer market making operation, mm -hmm. basically. So it's, uh, you know, the components of DeFi on the AMM side. Yield farming, I just see as repo facilities, continuous repo facilities. The problem is it's a house of cards at the end of the day. I've, I've tried to do it. I, I know guys who do it and are, have raised hedge funds specific to this algorithmic trading. But if any, you know, and, and often it's 24 steps or 36 steps, but the returns are phenomenal uh, at the end of the day. But if one chain in that or one link in that chain breaks, everything comes toppling down. So it's, it, you know, it's, uh, it's not for the, uh, it's not for the wary at all, but, uh, but, you know, some, you know, hundred plus percent returns. I mean, I, I think all of us may know, like with Solana, I stake Solana, I'm getting a 10 to 12% return, just putting it in there. And uh, where can you get those types of returns at? It, it's, it's really exciting. It can take up 23 and a half, 23.9 per uh, hours of your day if you wanted to, and you could lose everything in a minute as well. Uh, but uh, these components, yield farming, uh, lending protocols, you know, Maker, Ave, Compound, et cetera. I mean, these are gonna become part of, um, you know, uh, part of CFI, you know, CFI to DeFi is the new FI. And uh, that's all gonna be components of it. Pat, and I just wanna say for, for you and I and everyone else on this call, I think we're all old enough on this call to remember when we said market makers, we were literally talking about a person at the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, if you recall. So hearing I'm not this idea that old, Ron. I'm not that old. <laughs> yeah. well, I saw I saw trading places. I know what's going on here. I know what's happening. I am the, the last piece on the market maker, just to explain why you needed a whole model, is gas fees. So because of gas fees, you can't do you can't do take or maker markets on on public blockchain. So you so so basically it was Vitalik actually came up with a whole new like a curve, a bonded curve for how you essentially do or a curve for how you essentially do uh paired of, like peer-to-peer -peer market making without having to have actual like you know spreads built into it super super exciting and, and patrick when we say curve we're just talking about a mathematical formula for price mathematical formula yeah and, it's, just, and exactly. it's very simple most people i think everybody on this could read you know the one page description and understand the math it's not yeah it's not crazy yeah absolutely so I, we're coming close to time uh we don't have any additional questions right now we do still have some coming in by email um, I, gentlemen, wonderful panel, as always. I want to give everyone an opportunity for those in the audience who want to, want to reach out or later. Uh, Kel, how can folks reach you, learn more about what you're doing, and then we'll go through the cycle as well. Oh, sure. Uh, Kel, K-E-L-L, -L, it's like hell with a K, at verity.com, V-E-R-A-D-Y.com. Excellent. Mr. Johnson. In the chat, Richard at Texas.Capital. Efficient as always, my friend. Patrick. Uh, Pat.Y at Bitwave.io, but Bitwave.io, come see what we're, what we're working on. You uh, need tax and accounting for crypto. Excellent. And Mr. Lavecchia. Uh, thank you, Ron. Pat at OasisProMarkets.com. Excellent. Uh, gentlemen, again, thank you for the panel. Let me end this session off by thanking all of you. Let me thank all of the attendees as well. And the last disclaimer I'll make, and all of you are sick and tired of my disclaimers, but nothing that you heard today was accounting, investment, tax, legal, or financial advice. Uh, all comments about Solana aside, but everyone, thank you so much for this. Really appreciate it. And, 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 and price predictions. And the, exactly. Thank you. Wall Street Blockchain Alliance cups for members. Thank you, Pat, for the plug. Uh, anyone interested in further information about the WSBA uh, who's not already a member, uh, please email us, email us info at wsba.co. Thank you all for being here. Have a wonderful evening. Chat soon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, Kel. Patrick, Richard, thank you, Kel. Uh, uh, Have a nice time.